I want my seven children, and I should be back on time. Thank you, Art, and thank you, Pastor Cisneros. And this is a little thing I've always done, and I always enjoy talking to intelligent audiences, and these precious little children are going to help me. Now, I'm going to name these children, and I want you to learn their names. I want to see if you can do what other audiences have done. The first one we're going to name, let's not name them. Let's just say when I point to this one, sin. What is it? Sin. Come on, everybody. What is it? Sin. Once more, sin. this one is law. Who is this? Law. Who is it? Law. This is grace. Who is this? Grace. Once more, grace. let's go backward. Grace. Law. Sin. That's very good. Let's go again. Savior. Who is this? Savior. Savior. Come on. Savior. Now, this one is gospel. What is it? Gospel. Let's see if we can go now. Sin, law, grace, Savior, gospel. Pastor Ortiz, we got another good audience. Now let's do it all the way to the end. This is? Sin, law, grace, Savior, gospel. This is preacher. Who is this? Preacher. And this one is church. What's his name? Church. church. Now, let's go and let's quote the Bible. The Bible says, who says? The Bible. the Bible says that is the transgression of God's law. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's do it one more time. The Bible says that Sin. is the transgression of law. Whoever hates Sin. must uphold the law. Whoever fights the law is upholding Sin. whether he likes it or not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Come on, ladies and gentlemen, grace. is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. Very good. Let's do that one more time. Grace. Is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And the Sin. die that we might have grace. which is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And Sin. gave us the law. which is the good news about the now the preaches the in his church. Now today you've got men fighting God's law in church. And they say that the law is done away with. You may go die. Now if you do away with the law, the Bible says where there is no law, there is no sin. So you may go. And if you do away with, sin. you don't need, grace. which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And if you don't need grace, you certainly don't need a who died that we might have grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And in that case, you don't need a, because it's the story of a savior who died that we might have grace which is pardon for sin which is breaking the law and if that be true what in the world do you need of and if you don't need him he might as well throw away the Shalom Shalom I need Yehuda Yorah I'm Judah the Shooter um that is uh the Hebrew way of saying um Ani, which I am, or uh, I. Uh, Yehuda, which is Judah. Ha, the Yorah. So, which is me, Shuda. So, Ani, Yehuda, Yorah, I'm Judah, the Shuda, because I shoot out scriptures, shoot out information. Now, I first want to give all praise and glory and honor to the Father. His name is only begotten, beloved Son, who currently sits at the right hand of the Father. Um, if you've never been to the channel, definitely please like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel where you'll get all different type of content, uh, dealing with the Bible, the Hebrew language, um, various topics that is being swept under the rug. Speaking of being swept under the rug, uh, I have a special guest here today who's uh, who's going to be speaking. Uh, she's my wife, um, and um, we're going to want to get into something a little bit special today. Now, I don't want to say too special because if you've been following me for years, you know, on other YouTube channels, I have spoken on this topic before. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite topics to talk about uh, of, out of all the biblical discussions. So um, over seven years ago, I did do an almost seven hour video. I had sat down with a pastor and uh, the pastor, of course, was running from my questions. And I um, 
I remember being really upset at this time because um, when you ask certain questions, bring ser- uh, certain things up, they don't really want to talk about it, kind of sweep it under the rug. So I did uh, do a lesson uh, so on my old YouTube channel, as you see right here. It's called Law versus Grace, Christianity Exposed 2. And I did do a series. Now, this particular part, even though it's two, um, it's only one uh, video on this topic. So I did topics on like Christmas, um, things like that. But part two was dealing with law versus grace. So when you go to the uh, the Christian church today, and when you bring things up in the Bible, um, matter of fact, I'm kind of going to let her uh, kind of speak on that. Uh, we had a nice, beautiful conversation about it. So I told her we'll, um, we'll have a discussion about it. And I'll let her um, ask questions to me from the viewpoint of the Christian church. All right. Um, so if you are watching this video and you would like me to address a scripture that we may or may not address in here, uh, definitely watch Law versus Grace because I'm sure I probably talked about it. Or you can ask the question here and we can kind of deal with it um, in the series, if you will. But I first want to get her question out of the way as well. All right, love. So um, why are we here today? What's going on? Talk to me. And make sure you speak up so they can hear. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Angela. <laughs> um, and as my king said, uh, we're going to uh, answer questions uh, that pertain to the law versus kind of like Christianity mm -hmm. versus Christianity, really. Uh, because the questions that will be posed are questions uh, that Christians uh, will say most of the time. Um, I don't know if he told you, but I come from a strong Christian background mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that I've heard is, uh, are things that Christians would say, um, to prove the point that, um, the, the concept of being an Israelite is wrong, mm -hmm. that it's, it's out of context, um, out of context, I mean, and that uh, it is not according to the Bible. So they don't necessarily, well, they don't use scriptures to battle the questions that I'm going to pose today. And so I wanted to do this video with my king so that I can share with the previous um, Christians that I was connected to um, so that they can get some sense of truth and know that these things are in the Bible. Now, before we get started going to that, let me ask you a question, because some of them may watch this and some of them may not. Some people who they may know may watch it or some people who have the same thought process may watch. Let me ask you some questions. Do you believe in the Bible? Yes. Do you believe in any other book besides the Bible? No. So you're not Muslim? No. Okay. And you don't read the Quran? No. Okay. Now, do you believe in the Father? Yes. Do you believe in the Son? Yes. Do you believe in the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the English or with the Hebrew word of saying the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you believe in the death of his son? Yes. Do you believe in his burial? Yes. Do you believe in his resurrection? Yes. Do you believe that, his, that he will make a second return? Yes. And you believe in all of the Bible? Yes. Okay. So... It is safe to say that you believe that who we call today Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. And no one, no man can come to the Father but by Christ. Yes. And you believe in all of what we call the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. Yes. Absolutely. All right. So go ahead. Go so, ahead. So as I was saying, um, we're going to basically dispel or disassemble mm -hmm. those questions. And we want to give truth to it, which will definitely come from scripture, won't come from our thoughts or how we feel or a quote or Google.com, Wikipedia.com. It's going to strictly come out of the Holy Writ, which is the scripture. And once again, you're not an atheist. No, I'm not. I believe in the most high. Okay. And when you say the most high, what are you talking about? The most high God. Of who? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. <laughs> it's a, the most high God of who? Because people be thinking that was you mean like Allah? Are you talking no. about the most high God of the Bible? 
Yes, the most high God of the Bible. Okay. All right. <laughs> and you believe that every word that Christ spoke is true. Yes, I do. Okay. And he's the Messiah. Yes, he is. And he's Lord and Savior. Yes, he is. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. I agree with her. All right. So uh let me see. Um, you do believe that he came in the flesh, right? I do. All right, and the reason why, uh, check this out. Um, let's read that really quick. Um, let me pull it up. Pull my Bible up. Boom, here we go. So we have first John chapter four and verse one. It says, Beloved, it says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So, in other words, don't believe everybody, right? But it says, test the spirit to see if that person is of God. It says, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Many false prophets, right? Verse two, it says, hereby we know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach in the Hebrew language is come in the flesh is of God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach in the Hebrew language as we would say, do you believe that he's come in the flesh? Yes. Okay. So according to that, she's of God. Uh, verse three, it says, and every spirit that confess not that Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus the Christ, is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist. You agree with that? Yes. Absolutely. Me too. It says, where have you have heard that it shall come? And even now it is in the world. All right, we also got 1 John chapter 2 and uh, verse 22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Yeshua or Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same have not the Father. But he that acknowledge the Son have the Father also. Do you acknowledge the Father? Yes. Do you acknowledge the son? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So that being said, um, on and for the record, you see what it is that we believe. Um, now with that being said, it's time to deal with false doctrines that is being taught today in your average Christian church. Now, when I say Christian, I'm not referring to like the term Christians in the Bible three times. Acts 11, 26, Acts 26, 28, 1 Peter 4, 16. The word Christian is there. But I'm talking about Christianity, your average Sunday worshiper. All right, love. So the floor is yours. Um, if you want to bring out any comments, questions, thoughts of ideas before we get started, the floor is yours, love. Yes, I wanted to. Uh, Anything. I, I want to add to. Uh, what we're talking about the law, but I want to do a big bonus conversation to the women mm -hmm. um, that are Christian so that they can understand how they're out of order when they are over these congregations and, you know, they call themselves prophets and or prophetess mm -hmm. and the modesty part and also the head covering part. We can do that on a different video. Okay. Because okay. That's really good. Okay. That's something, uh, especially if you all comment and want to know about that, we can definitely talk about that. Yes. That is separate from like the law and the grace part, but those are good. In fact, we may do that as part two. Um, so we have to come back and watch this clip. If um, if y'all see it, I've done videos and they did this. Say, hey, I thought you all was going to talk about that. Don't let me forget. All right. So that's something we can talk about at a different video. I want to talk about this law thing. Yes. But uh, you got any more questions or comments you want to bring up, babe? No. I Anything, wanna, love? I, I just want to uh, just speak to the Christian because I am going to share this video with uh, the people that I know that okay. are still in Christianity. And I just uh, admonish others. You might be in the truth, but if you know and not out of 10, you do know any Christians, this is definitely going to open up their eyes and give them clarification and knowledge as to the reason why uh, we should keep the law. Okay, great. And um, we might have to do this a series too. As you've seen um, on my old YouTube channel, 
I freestyled a six hour, 24 minute video dealing with this topic. So I'm familiar with every single scripture that the church used with dealing with. You don't have to keep the law anymore. I'm familiar with every scripture. We ain't gonna bring nothing up. Um, but let's go ahead and deal with it. So uh, this is uh, rapid fire. Um, how many questions you got? I have five. Okay, ask. Uh, bring all five questions out first. Okay, number one. Okay. Uh, most Christians says uh, the law is the schoolmaster, so we don't have to keep it. Number two, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. We don't have to keep the law. And these are in Law versus Grace video. Go ahead. Number three. Um, keeping the law was only in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to keep the law. So mm -hmm. they're stating that there's nowhere in the New Testament where uh, the Most High or His Son, Christ, uh, says that we need to keep the law. Mm -hmm. Number four. If you can't keep one law, you can't keep none of them. Right. Number five. Uh, the question is always posed, who knows how many laws there are? Go no, no one does. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to keep all of them. All right. So these are all things that I've talked about in my video, Law versus Grace. Uh, so if anybody who is uh, curious about that video, once again, I did the video over seven years ago. I definitely urge you and encourage you to definitely watch this video. All right, so that being said, love, um, you ready to dive on in? Yes. All right, let me let me put my phone, make sure my phone on silent, and we about to go ahead and dive on in. One second. All right. So, all right, let's go ahead and start back. Go back to question number one. Remember the five questions. Now, um, um, do you want me to just like? How do you want me to do this? Do you want us to do this into lessons or you want me to just rapid fire, just answer the questions directly and just deal with it as we go? Um, can can you deal with it as we go? Like, I mean, you want me to go into debt or do you want me to just deal with it head on? Well, since we here, we just go into debt. Okay, cool. All right, so go ahead. Go back to the first question. Okay, the first question is, the law is the schoolmaster. So we don't have to keep it. All right. So the law is the schoolmaster. So we don't have to keep it. This is based off a scripture that we know today is in the book of Galatians chapter three, dealing with uh, verse 25, which says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Go ahead. Ask your question one more time. The law is the schoolmaster. So mm -hmm. we don't have to keep it. All right. And also verse 24, we're for the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we, may, that we might be justified by faith. So this is the two scriptures that the Christian church will use and they do not fully understand the context. So yes, the law is our schoolmaster, absolutely. But what law is he speaking about? Now, before we get started, understand and know this, that there is more than one part of the law. So now this is about to be really good because the Christian church for the most part, is not aware of which law or what did Paul mean when he said the law was our schoolmaster. On and for the record, yeah, the law is our schoolmaster. But we're about to get some context of what Paul was speaking about when he wrote it. So that being said, let's go back. Now, verse 24 again says, the uh, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to who? Christ. That we might be justified, meaning this word justified or justification is declared righteous, innocent, by faith. Then it says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So now, if the Christians are just reading this and say, well, right here, we the law was our schoolmaster, we're not justified by faith. Well, before diving into this, the same Apostle Paul said this. So either we have a contradiction or we don't understand Paul's letters. Romans chapter 2 and verse 13. This is what he said here. He says, for not the hearers of the law are just, as the word just, are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So in Galatians 3, it says about justification, but we justify by faith. But the same Paul says right here, but the doers of the law shall be justified as well. 
So either we have a contradiction with the same author or somebody's don't understand Galatians 3, which we're about to go back to. There's one more thing I want to deal with before going and dealing with the topic at hand. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, an account meaning considering that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul. So now we see that Peter is going on record for the apostle Paul. And look at what he says. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him that have written unto you. So the wisdom that Paul was given, he wrote to us. Then he says, as also in all his epistles, all Paul's epistles, all Paul's writings, speaking in them of these things in which some things, means some things that he wrote in his epistles, look at this, hard to be understood. So Peter was going on record and he's saying, look, the wisdom that was given to him that he wrote to us, there were some things that Paul wrote in his letter that was hard to understand. So understand this and know this when going into dealing with Paul's letters, there are things that Paul wrote that's hard for people to grasp, hard for people to understand. But he says, was they that are what? Unlearned and unstable rest, W-R-E-S-T, rest, so for wrestle, fight, twist. So Paul is going on record and saying there are some things in Paul's letters that just simply hard to be understand by the people who consider to be unstrengthened. The people that are unstable, who are unlearned. They end up twist, twisting Paul's letters, wrestle with them. But then not only they do that, he says, as they do also the other scriptures. What other scriptures do you think he's talking about? It's what you call today the Old Testament. So he said that they even twist the other scriptures. And that kind of already answered one of your questions already. If the Old Testament is done away with, why is Peter going on record and talking about the other scriptures? Because yes. these were letters. But then he said, because remember, he called Paul's writings epistles. But he called the other, like the Tanakh, which is what we call the Old Testament, the other scriptures. But then he said they do it to their own destruction. So there were things that Paul wrote that was hard to be understood by unlearned people. And they end up wrestling or wrestling or fighting or twisting his scriptures. I mean, twisting his letters just like they do the other scriptures. Now, I want you all to pause and think about this while I take a sip of my soda. Mm -hmm. All right. That being said, we're going to go ahead and go and deal back with the topic. We're back at Galatians 3. Ask the question one more time. The law is the schoolmaster, so we don't have to keep it. All right. So, as I said earlier, the law is our schoolmaster, and we are no longer under the schoolmaster. But what is the schoolmaster? What law is he speaking about? Let's go ahead and deal with it. Verse 19, Paul, the Apostle Paul asks a question here. He says here, he says, Wherefore then serveth the law? Wherefore then serveth the law? In other words, what purpose did the law serve? Think about that question. He also says it was added because of transgressions. Let me put that right here. One second. It was added because of transgressions. Now, transgressions, if you don't know, it means sins. Okay? So he says, what purpose did the law serve? It was added because of sins. Sins, transgressions. Now, remember, guys, if you look at 1 John 3 and 4, it says, whosoever ever commit of sin what they do they transgresseth or break also the law for sin is the transgression of the law let me put that right here sin is the transgression of the breaking of the law got that so galatians 3 and 19 again he says what for then serve the law what purpose did the law serve it was added because of transgressions. We just learned in 1 John 3 and 4 that sin is the transgression of the breaking of the law. So then it says, till the seed should come, 
to whom the promise was made. Now, who's the seed? Verse 16 tells us here, not to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Christ. So now we know who the seed is being talked about in verse 19. Again, what purpose did the law serve? It was added because of sins or transgressions, so Christ should come to whom the promise was made. Who was the promises made to, guys? The Israelites, through the bloodline descendant of Abraham. Then it said, and it was ordained or established by angels in the hand of a mediator. So let's go ahead and break this verse down. Once again, it said, what for then serve the law was added because of transgressions. What was the law that was added because of transgressions? Think about something. There was something that was added or put in place when you sinned. When you transgressed the law, there was a work or a deed that the children of Israel had to do before Christ came. What was that law that was added if you committed a sin? What did you have to do? Hey, what did you have to do if you committed a sin? If you, you had to make sacrifice. You had to make sacrifice. Animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice. Also, animal sacrifice is known as atonement, propitiation, reconciliation. These were things that were put in place if you sinned. Let's get an example. Now, remember, the verse said in verse 19, copy and paste it down here. Wherefore, then serve the law, it was added because of transgressions. Leviticus 16 and 16 clearly says this. It says, <clears throat> it says, and he shall make an atonement, which is what? An animal sacrifice. He shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. Right there. So atonement or animal sacrifice was put in place when you transgress the law. When you transgress the law, there was a sacrifice that was put in place. It says, and he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. That was Leviticus 16 and 16. Atonement, atonement, atonement. This is what you know as animal sacrifice, propitiation, reconciliation. Understand that? This is why when you look right here, when it says, and when he had made an end of recon uh, reconciling, the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar where you committed sacrifices. He shall bring the live goat. Got that? It says, and Aaron shall both lay hands on the head of the live goat and confess all over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all of their transgressions and all of their sins putting them on the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So look at this. Their sins were cast upon an animal. Somebody took the place for those animals. Somebody took the place for that. This was the schoolmaster that got us ready and trained for Christ. So, going back, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? What purpose did the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. All you have to do is ask your pastor, hey, what was, before Jesus came, what was the law that was put in place for the children of Israel that they had to do so that they can be forgiven for their sins before Christ came? What law did was put in place if they transgress, if they committed transgressions? What law did God add later for them to do that? Until Christ came. He got to tell you. 
animal sacrifice, atonement. That's what this is talking about, and that's what we're finna get into. So atonement was put in place in case the children of Israel went off and committed a sin. So it says, Wherefore then serve the law it was added because of transgressions, which is sins, so Christ should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now dealing with a mediator, say link between. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 clearly says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, before Christ came, who was the mediator? The Levitical priests, those that were of the descendants of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. These were the people who were the mediators between God and man before Christ came. How do we know? Go back to Leviticus 16. It says in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of Aaron, I mean, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered, look at that, they gave a sacrifice, but they end up dying, though, as it says. Verse 2, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak unto Aaron your brother, that he, that he come not at all times into the holy place within or behind the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. Look at what the Lord says right here. For I will appear in the cloud of on the mercy seat. This is also dealing with sacrifices. So from a spiritual aspect, the children of Israel, literally, their sacrifices was brought to the Lord before Christ came. That's what that mercy seat was for. Then mercy is grace, right? Yeah. The seat of mercy, the seat of grace. That's what got them grace. Then it says, thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock. That's a young bull. For a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Now, we just learned earlier in 1 John 3 and 4 that sin is the transgression of the law. So, before Christ came, if you committed a sin, there was a sacrifice right there. We just seen one right here, a young bullock. A sacrifice. This was the schoolmaster that got us trained and ready for Christ. Because essentially, the children of Israel were taking their sacrifices to Christ. He says it right here. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat in verse 2. I, the Lord, and the sacrifices was brought right before him. Look at that. The schoolmaster was getting us trained and ready for Christ. Now, it's going to go down in this video today. So, check it. That being said, when we, matter of fact, I want to grab Hebrews 9 real quick. It says right here uh, in verse 22, it says, And almost all things were by the law purged or cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there was no remission. Remission means forgiveness. Blood had to be shed so that we could be forgiven for our sins, which is why we are justified by the blood of Christ today. Now, I'm going slow with this because there's so much to say dealing with this topic. That being said, before Christ came, before he shed his blood, what were we justified by? What, what, how do we get forgiven for our sins? Let's go back to Leviticus. We're going to go to chapter 4 and verse 20 because we were speaking about a bullock, right? So it says, I'm going to start at 19. It says, it says, and he shall take the fat and he shall take all of his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. Altar was for what? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. It says, and he, talking about the priest, shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock or the bull for a sin offering. For a sin offering, guys. You listen to this, Christians? For a sin offering. So shall he do with this and the priests who were the sons of Aaron. That were the priests. We know Christ is now the high priest now under the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6 and 20. So it said, and the priest shall make an atonement for them. Fools to them, all Israel. And look at this part. 
and it shall be forgiven them. So the children of Israel were forgiven for their sins from this sin offering when the priest made an atonement, when the priest made a sacrifice because the children of Israel did what? Sinned. They transgressed the law. That's what happened. And it says, and he shall carry forth the bullock without or outside the camp and burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for the congregation. Look at that. It was a sin offering. This is before Christ. There's different parts of the law. And if we have time in this particular video, we will cover it. But dealing with scriptures like, we're not justified by the deeds of the law, and we'll deal with these topics. You will always see words like blood, atonement, uh, sin, um, propitiation, and things like deeds of the law, works of the law. When you see these things, you have to look at the context. Paul taught from the Torah, which means the law. He taught from the law. But people have been twisting Paul's letters because they are unstable and they are unstrengthened in the word. And they, they wrestle with Paul's letters who taught from the law. Now, going back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, and this is just the meat of what is being said. So he says, what for then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, which is sins. To the seed should come to whom the promise was made. We know whom the promise was made to. And it was established or ordained or appointed by angels in the hand of a mediator. We know that mediator is Christ. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. We just read 1 Timothy 2 and 5. There's one God, uh, there's um, uh, one God, uh, and there's one mediator between God and man, that's Christ. Then he goes and says in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? That's a question that he asked there. Let me go and highlight this. Add it because of transgressions. And highlight that. But in verse 21, it says, is the law then against the promises of God? What law is he speaking about, guys? I highlighted it. The law that was added because of what? Transgressions. So he's asking is the law that he spoke about in verse 19, is that law that was added for transgressions, is that against the promises of God? Is that against the promises of God? No. That's why I said, God forbid, by no means. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily or truly, righteousness should have been by sacrificing animals. That's the law that he's speaking about. Righteousness should have been by the law. What law is he talking about? The law that was added because of transgressions. That's the topic that he's speaking about right here. So then he goes on to say, but the scripture have concluded all under sin. Why is he still talking about what we call the Old Testament? He said the scripture. These were letters he was writing. There wasn't a Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is what you know is the Old Testament. But the scripture have concluded, all of us have transgressed the law. Now, where in the scripture can we read something like that? I'll give an example. The book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 11. It says, yeah, all Israel have transgressed your law. Right there. Even by departing that they may not obey your voice, therefore the curse is poured upon us and the oath or the promise that is written in the Torah of the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we sinned against him. So here it is. Paul understood scriptures like this. All Israel have transgressed your law. Going back to Galatians 3, he, see, he goes on to say uh in verse 22 but the scripture included all under sin all have transgressed the law that the promise by faith of yeshua hamashiach or jesus the christ might be given to them that believe why is that guys because before christ came before he came we had to be justified 
through the sacrificing of animals, we have to put our faith and belief that these priests who were sacrificing for their sins and then for the rest of the nation could go before our God and sacrifice these animals so that we can be forgiven. So yeah, we are justified by faith. We do got to believe. Why is that? Because during this time, there were people who didn't believe that Christ was the one whom the Old Testament was pointing to. And I hate to use the word Old Testament, but that's what you all know it as. You had to put your faith in these animals, but the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. That's Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. And if we have time, we'll deal with that. But let's go back. All right, so Galatians 3, once again, then it goes on to say in verse 23, it says, but before faith came, now who is the faith that is speaking about? Christ. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. The first question is, who's the we? Who are the people that were kept under the law before Christ came? The children of Israel. But then he say, we were kept under the law. What law is he speaking about? Verse 19 tells us the law that was added because of transgressions. That's the topic at hand. That's the law that we were, that, that we were up under before Christ came, before faith came. Before you had to put your faith in Christ, that's the law that we were kept under. That's the law that the children of Israel was violating anyway. So it says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law. What law, guys? The law that was added because of transgressions. Then it says, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Who was the person that was revealed after this that came? Christ. Christ. That's why he says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. What law? The law that was added because of transgressions. Animal sacrifice. That's the topic that is being discussed here. It says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Look at that. What was the law that they were doing that brought us to Christ? If you fully understand the Levitical priesthood, also known as the order of Aaron, you understand how this got us trained and ready for Christ. Literally. So when you look from verse 19 on down, he's speaking about what? Because remember he asks, what serve is the law? What purpose did the law serve? We know what law he's talking about when he keeps saying the law. How do we know? Because he said it was added because of transgressions. And then he said, was the law against the promise of God? What law? Because remember, he asked what purpose did the law serve? When he said the law was our schoolmaster, what law? The same law that he's speaking about in verse 19. The law was that was added because of transgressions. So he says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Because remember, he said before faith came, we were kept under the law. Here it says we justify by faith, and we are. Absolutely. Remember, I told you all, I showed you all earlier that the same Apostle Paul said this. Because remember, he said we justify by faith. Right here in um, Romans 2 and 13, the same Paul says, For not the hearers of the law are just or righteous before God, but the doers. But the doers of the law shall be justified. The same Apostle Paul said that we are justified by doing the law as well. The same Apostle Paul that said that we are justified by faith. Same Paul. He says, but after that faith has come, meaning after that Christ has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, a tutor. What schoolmaster was he talking about? You have to go back to verse 19 and read it down. The law that was added because 
of transgressions till Christ, till Christ came to whom the promises was made to. So long story short, that's dealing with atonement, animal sacrifices. That's the law or the schoolmaster that we are no longer under but you still got to keep those commandments. And that's something we'll deal with later. Got that, babe? Mm -hmm. So dealing with that, the law was our schoolmaster. Absolutely. So the person who said that is correct. However, the schoolmaster, to understand the schoolmaster, you have to go back to verse 19 and read it on down to understand what Paul was actually speaking about. Now, there's something else I want to deal with in Galatians uh, chapter 3 uh, here. Uh, verse 13, because we can really do this whole chapter, but I just kind of want to deal with some of the meat of it. Verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. So let's go ahead and deal with this here. So it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Hmm. Matter of fact, let me go back to 10. No, we're going to go back to 10. It says, for as many as of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written. Curse is everyone that continue not to do all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Where did he get this from? Where is he quoting from? Because he said, for it is written. For him to quote the scripture lets us know that what we call today the Old Testament is still valid because he's still saying it is written or for it is written. That means it's written in what we would call today the Old Testament. Let's see, where did he get that from? Because he says what is written, curses everyone that continue not to do all things is written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. It says, curse be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, amen. He's quoting Moses. Now, why would he be teaching against Moses' law, but he's quoting Moses' law? Hmm. Let's go back to Galatians 3 again. Verse 11. Now, the works of the law is the same thing that he talked about in chapter 2, 16 on down. He also talked about in Romans chapter 3, verse 20 on down as well, about the deeds of the law. And if we have time, we'll go over that. That's dealing with sacrifice as well. Then he goes on to say, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it is evident for the just shall live by faith, you know, he go talking about the works of the law, say they're not justified by it. This is Romans 3, verse 20 on down to 28. And if we have time, we'll talk about that too. He said, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Guess what? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18 real quick. And verse 5. All right. So it says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, which a man do, he shall live in them. Hold on one second, guys. OK, now, that being said, let's go to the book of Habakkuk real quick as well. Let me pull that up. Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Here we go. Habakkuk chapter two and verse four. What says, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Why does Paul keep quoting what we call the Old Testament? If Because that goes deal with the question that they were talking about earlier. Well, why is he quoting from the Old Testament if it's not valid? Why is he saying, for it is written, or it is written? Why is he quoting the Tanakh? Why is that? Let's go back. Did he quote a prophet in the Bible? It says right here, the just shall live by faith. Now, according to the Christian doctrine, they were keeping the law in the Old Testament. But he's quoting the Old Testament. Hmm. Verse 12. And the law is not of faith. What law? The works of the law, the deeds of the law, animal sacrifice. Remember, the same Paul said, for not the hearers of the law just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. He ain't contradicting himself. He says here, 
the man that doeth them shall live in them. We just got done reading Leviticus 18, verse 5. Quoting Moses once again. He's about to quote Moses once again right here in verse 13. Christ redeemed us. Who's the us? The children of Israel. From the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. Letting us know that Christ took on that curse. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Where did he get that from? Deuteronomy chapter 21. Verse 23, which reads, I'm starting 23, 22, I mean. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and you shall hang him on a tree. It says his body shall not remain all night upon the tree. But you or thou shall in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is cursed of God or cursed of God. Didn't Paul just say curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree? This is the law that Christ came to redeem us from. The penalty, when you broke the law, you received grace and mercy, but it didn't give you the excuse to break the law. But then it says that the land be not defiled, of which the Lord your God giveth thee for inheritance. So here it is, Christ took that place, the penalty of death, by being hung on a tree. Yes, guys, Christ was hung on a tree during his crucifixion. Yes, Christ was hung on a tree during his crucifixion. Absolutely. Let's see about that. Let's go to Acts chapter 5 real quick. The book of Acts chapter 5 verse 31. And it says, what are we, what are we at 31? I'm at 30. The God of our fathers and ancestors raised up Jesus of Yeshua who you slew and hung on a tree. Right there. Right there who you slew and hung on a tree. Look at that. So yes, Christ was hung on a tree. And this is very important because again, this is not really widely taught in the Sunday church today. Was you aware of that in the Sunday church, babe? No. You say what? Yeah, no. Now why do you, go ahead, I'm listening. Ask the question again. I'm sorry. So the question when it talked about um, Christ being hung on a tree. No, I always thought he was just hung on a cross. Right. And that cross was a stake of wood, which is dealing with the tree. And most are not aware of that. They don't know that, yo, Christ really was hung on a tree. So he really did take on that curse for us. Now that we're in Acts 13, let's look at verse 28. It says, and though they found no cause of death in him, talking about Christ, yet they desired, I mean, yet desired they uh, Pilate, talking about Pontius Pilate, that he should be slain or killed, verse 29. And when they had fulfilled, it says all that was written of him, they go to the word fulfill, <laughs> it says they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. So there it is again, the tree once again. Let's deal with another one. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. Look at what it says about Christ. It says, um, uh, what we at, what we had, uh, who did no sin, neither was that guile or falsehood found in his mouth. There was a prophecy about us in Isaiah 53 about this. It says, and then when you read John 19 in eight, 18 and 19 chapter, you read about this. It says, and when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed to himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear and carry our sins in his body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live in I mean, unto righteousness by whose stripes we healed. That's Isaiah 53 and 5. So yes, Christ was hung on a tree. So when you look at Galatians 3, when it says right here, curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. That's what it mean right here when it said Christ redeemed us. Uh, then it said he was made a curse for us. Why? Because he took on the penalty of death. So therefore, if you break the law today, you are not stoned or you are not killed. You don't receive the penalty of death because Christ took on that for us. He is our atonement. Now, there's so much I want to say with dealing with Galatians 3, but I want to just uh, narrow it down to those questions that you asked. 
Okay, so we just dealt with question number one. And what was question number one? The law is the school, uh, is our schoolmaster, so we don't have to keep it. Absolutely. So we just got done dealing with that. We don't have to keep it. What law was he talking about? The law that was added because of transgressions. So yes, we don't have to keep the law that was added because of transgressions. Why? Because that was our schoolmaster to get us trained and ready for Christ. So if you said in that aspect, yes, you are correct. Absolutely. No more sacrificing animals. Matter of fact, I'll end it with this because there's so much I want to say. Hebrews 10 and verse 10, uh, when it says, by, uh, whoop, hold up, Hebrews 10, uh, 10, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. By the which we are sanctified are set apart through the offering of the sacrificing of the body of Je Jesus Christ once and for all. When you go down here in verse 18, it says, now what remission of these is or what forgiveness of these is, there was no more offering or sacrifices for sin. So what that means, there was no more sacrificing animals when you sin. Why? Because we have the perfect sacrifice that's why it says right here for by one offering of sacrifice and he have made uh, he have perfected forever them that are sanctified are set apart christ is the sacrifice he's the atonement he's the propitiation therefore we don't have to do that anymore but you still got to keep those commandments and i hope we get to talk about that but go ahead love Second question is what? The second question is, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law so we don't have to keep the law, which is the commandments. So mm -hmm. I want to specify that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we just read about uh, in Acts 13. We had just read um, here. Let me go back to the Acts 13 real quick. Acts 13, uh, 29, uh, 28. It says, and when they had fulfill all that was written of him this is what we're about to learn it was things that was fulfilled about christ go ahead ask your question one more time jesus christ came to fulfill the law all right so therefore we don't have to keep the law or slash command so this is what they deal with dealing with the sermon on the mount uh which is known as matthew 5 17 they take it out of context let's go ahead and read it so it says, think not. That's the first key word right there. Think not. Don't even get that in your head that I have come to destroy the law. This is what Christ said. He didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. Then it says, or the prophets. I didn't come to do away or destroy the prophets either. Meaning I didn't come to do away with what was, I mean, what the prophets had said. He says, I am not come to destroy, but to what? To fulfill. This is the part we're going to deal with. Yes, he came to fulfill what was written about him in the law and in the prophets. Think not that he come to destroy the law. Don't even get that in your head that he come to destroy the law. He didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill. What is this talking about? What did he come to fulfill that was written about him? Let's see. Let's go to Luke 24 and verse 44. And we'll come back there. Luke 24, 44 it says, and he said unto them, this is what Christ said. These are the words. Because remember he said, I ain't come to destroy the law or the prophets. Who wrote the law? Moses. Who were the prophets? Ezekiel, Hosea, Jeremiah, Daniel, Zechariah. These were the prophets. So he says, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled. Because he said, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. He says, all things must be fulfilled. Watch this. Which were written in the law of Moses. Didn't he say, think not I come to destroy the law? Or the prophets? He says, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So what you all who in the Christian church don't fully understand. When he says, think not, I come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Yes, that is correct. But what he's talking about is he, he didn't, he didn't come to do away with or get rid of what was written about him in the law and the prophet. He came to fulfill what was written about him. 
He came to uphold it. He came to carry it out, not to get rid of, not to do away with at all. So he says, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Has everything been fulfilled in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning Christ? No, absolutely not. Well, in Psalms it did. No, because look, in Psalms 110, look at this. Psalms chapter 110. Check this out. Look at what it says about Christ right here. He shall judge among the heathens and fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. That hasn't happened yet. Look at this. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's two different lords there. Two different lords. When we go into what we call the Hebrew text, Right here for my Hebrew readers. Let David miss more than um Yehoah. Let uh let Onai hear a psalm of David. Naum, which is to say Yehoah, which is the most high, let Onai to my Lord. Right there. Right there. Then we have the word Shev, Lemini, Ad, Ashit, Oivecha. Then we have the word Hadom. Sit at my right hand until I make your hostile ones or your hostiles or your enemies your footstool. Right there in the Hebrew text. Two different lords, two different masters that we see in there. So the Lord at the right hand, right here, the Lord at your right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. What else is said about this Lord? The Lord of sworn when I repent, may he not go back on what he said. Look at what it says about this Lord. He's a priest forever after the order or under the order of Melchizedek. Under the order of Melchizedek. That's the Lord at the right hand. How do we know that? Hebrews 6 and 20. Whether the forerunner is, for us is answered. Even Jesus or Yeshua made in high priest forever after the order or under the order of Melchizedek. That's talking about Christ. And it talks about how he would strike through kings and devils wrath. And that is yet to be fulfilled. He ain't done. He's not done. Read the question one more time. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. So we don't have to keep it. Okay, Matthew 5, 17 again. Think not that I come to destroy the law. Right there. Do Christians believe that Jesus came? Yes, they do. So understand, Christians, if you believe that Jesus came, he just told you he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. He says, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's get another example. Acts chapter three and verse 18. Look at this. It says, but those things was God had, which God before, before mean what? Back then. Was God before have shown by the mouth of all his prophets. Remember, he said he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, right? So he says here that Christ should suffer. He has so fulfilled. So here it is. The prophets wrote about Christ's suffering. We can read about these things. He came to fulfill what was written about him in the law and in the prophets. One of the things was his suffering. We just read it in Acts 13. We just seen it right here in Acts 3 and 18. We just saw it in Luke 24, 44. Literally. Get this. Let's go to John chapter 5. Verse 45 through 47, this is written in blood. Christ said this. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accused of you, even Moses, just as Moses, in whom you trust me, who you put your hope in, who you believe in. Verse 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Now look at this. Christ is saying that Moses wrote of him. Verse 47, but if you believe not his writings, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what they would call the book of the law or the law of Moses. Christ said, if you believe not his writings, how? How should you believe my words? Christ saying this. How should you believe his words then? 
That's dealing with the law of Moses, his law. So check it. Go to X. No, I'm going to hold that one. Um, We're going to go back to that uh, Matthew 5 and 17. It says, think not that I come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What did he come to fulfill? We just seen right here that Christ should suffer. He is so fulfilled. When we look at doing his crucifixion, it is finished. What was finished? The things that was written about him in the law and in the prophets. Showing us that he's the Messiah. Verse 18, for verily or truly I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass. Is heaven and earth still here? Yes. Absolutely. To heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. To all, not some, not few, but to all be fulfilled. Now watch this. In, in the prophets, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15 says, for behold, the Lord will come with fire. Don't Christians believe in the second return of Christ? Yes. says, the Lord will come with fire. The Lord ain't came with fire. That ain't happened yet. It says, so all be fulfilled, right? Yes. This hasn't happened yet. So the Lord will come with fire and with his chair like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Well, this ain't happened yet. So all has not been fulfilled. He says, for by fire and by sword would the Lord plead. I mean, he going to enter into judgment with all flesh. And the slain of the killings of the Lord shall be many. Sounds like what I just read in Psalms 110. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens, places of worship, in the midst eating swine's flesh, pork, and the abomination, abominable foods that he told us not to eat, and the mouse, which he told us not to eat, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, shall be consumed. That means destroyed together, said the Lord. So if you believe in the second coming of Christ, and if you eating these foods that God told us not to eat during the second return, it's going to enter into judgment and you will be destroyed. All of y'all doing that will be consumed together, said the Lord. Christians, you got to show where that was fulfilled. You got to show where that was fulfilled. Good luck. This future prophecy. Why do you think you go down to verse 22 when it, it quotes basically direct quote from Revelation 21, 1 through 5 about the new heaven, new earth. It says, for as the new heavens and new earth, which will I make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and name remain. Right there. So this hasn't been fulfilled yet. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. That hasn't happened yet. So Isaiah was talking about the new heaven. Christ said right here in Matthew 5 and 18, he clearly said right here. For verily or truly I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass one jot on one tittle, the smallest thing shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. To all be fulfilled. And we just seen right there, the second coming of Christ, the new heaven, and him destroying people eating swine flesh, pork, pig. They're going to be destroyed together. You know, they like to twist 1 Timothy 1-5. through They like to deal with uh, Peter's vision in Acts 10, 12-15, but they never read down to 28. They like to deal with Matthew 15 and Mark 7. It's not what goes to the mouth of the fowls of man, but that was coming out of the mouth. I know every scripture y'all use. Romans 14. I know every scripture y'all try to twist. And that's something we'll deal with later, dealing with the dietary laws. We'll deal with that later too. That's in uh, the Law versus Grace video though. I deal with that in there. So that's in that video, the Law versus Grace. And that was almost 10 years ago. So you better know and understand I've learned so much more than that Law versus Grace video I did over 10 years ago. So if you can't get past that, you really ain't getting past it today. That was almost 10 years ago. And I had only been in the truth a few years. So look at this. We see heaven and earth is still here. So that means the law still stands. 
Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, like what the church is doing, and shall teach men so. The church is teaching, you don't have to keep those commandments. Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't do away with it. He didn't get rid of it. Right here, fulfilled in one word, love. Yeah, he ain't getting rid of it, though. Still got to do it. <laughs> so it says, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You're the last one getting in. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, which who was doing the law, but at the same time, it will be hypocrites. That's another topic, though. It says, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Right there, your righteous got to succeed them. Righteousness is what? What is righteousness? Let's get an example of righteousness. I can do that all day. Psalms chapter 119, verse 172, which says right here, it says, my tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. That's righteousness. Got to keep the commandments. Got to keep the commandments. Luke chapter one, verse five, it says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. But how were they righteous? Walking in the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord blameless. Keeping the commandments of God. One more, Deuteronomy. I'll give one more. Deuteronomy 6, verse 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statues to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And this shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. So dealing with the Matthew 5 here in verse 17, think now that I come to destroy the law of the prophets, I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Absolutely. You're right, Christians. But the context of that, he came to fulfill what was written about him in the law and in the prophets. This is a long story short. He said, till heaven and earth shall pass. Heaven and earth is still here. According to the doctrine, you Christians, you will know and understand there will be a new heaven, new earth. But it said, until heaven and earth pass. Now, one jot and one tiller shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. To all be fulfilled. Not some. Not most, but to all be fulfilled. Literally. But look at this. We still here. Luke chapter 16, verse 17. What did Christ say right here? He says, um, I'm going to start here. It says, the law and the prophets unto John, since that the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass then one tittle of the law to fail. You still got to keep that law, ladies and gentlemen. Still got to keep it. Luke 24, 44, once again, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. That ain't all done. It's not all done. Go ahead, love. What's the next one? Okay, the next, the third question is... We had three out of five. And this is just a long story short. There's so much more I can deal with and so many other scriptures I can deal with that Christians like to bring up. And I welcome them all. We can even sit and have a discussion. So if you all send this video to somebody and they say, nah, cause, and this and blah, and because he got to remember this. Well, check this out. Don't hide. Let's sit and talk. That brother said he'll talk with you. Let, let's set it up on Zoom. I'll drop the Zoom link and we can talk. But you better have your Bible. And you better let me ask you questions because I got questions for you. And look, check this out. If I'm wrong, how about you sit in a high seat and I ask you questions? How about you get in a high seat? And after you get in a high seat, put me in a high seat. And we can sit and talk. We can talk it out. We can have a discussion. We can have a friendly discussion. Or we can have a debate over it too. As long as we ain't arguing going back and forth and you ain't running, ducking, and dodging my questions. 
if you believe in Paul's letters, if you are a Christian, we can talk it out. We can debate it out. If you saying, oh, I don't believe all that. All right, well, look, let's sit and have, but we ain't even got to debate it. We can have a friendly discussion. You can ask me questions and you can say, look, look Judah, I don't want to debate, but I do got questions. Okay, cool. When you done, I got questions for you too. So don't throw rocks and hide your hand. Let's have this discussion. Let's talk about it. I'm willing to talk about it with anybody, bishop, elder, priest, deacon, pastor, grandma, sister, mama, daddy, cousin, brother, lover, cousin, whoever. We can talk about it. We have a friendly discussion about it. I can put you in a high seat, which I would love to do that. I know you're not going to agree to be put in a high seat. You ain't going to agree to put, let me put you in a high seat. You ain't going to agree to that. Or you can put me in a high seat too. We ain't got to argue. We can do rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. Only if you got your Bible with you though. And only if you learned. Don't, I don't, if you don't study this Bible, no, I'm not going to waste my time. But I would drop the Zoom link and we can have a discussion about it. As long as you ain't trying to overtalk me and I ain't going to overtalk you and you getting in your feelings when I'm putting you in the high seat asking you questions. Because, oh, yeah, I got some questions. Right now, she's asking me questions. This is rapid fire questions right now. You know what I'm saying? So she's asking me random questions and we dealing with it as we go. Okay, babe. Next question. This is three out of five. What's up? Okay, I got a bonus. okay you got a bonus question. Go ahead. You want me to say it? Whatever you want to do. It's your floor. Okay. I get a bonus question. I just thought of something else. Just that. don't forget it. I won't. No, I just ask it now. Ask the bonus question okay, now. Okay, so we have a bonus question. Mm -hmm. and so this ain't the three. So this is it's five questions, but she asked she a bonus question. This is the bonus question before we go to question number three. Go ahead. So the bonus question is... Uh, it's pertaining to the commandments, and uh, they say, I, I think you might have quoted the scripture about uh, you can eat what you want to eat or mm -hmm. whatever. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. So That's going to be the dietary law. Yeah. So, when we go into the dietary topic. Yes. Um, uh, the first Timothy four, um, it says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be received. If it be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they'll say right there, all creatures of God is good. That what you're talking about? Yes. And then the other scripture you said that said it's not what comes out of a man. I mean, it's not what goes into the mouth of the fowls of man, what goes out of the mouth. Yes. You want me to just deal with it now? No, I want you to wait because this is good. And I, Are you sure? I to go in order. Uh, it's like you just brought it up. You, you kind of <laughs> opened the bag. Okay, but that's why I'll give them, them, I'll give you all a snippet. All right. <laughs> Because she opened the bag for it. So uh, we'll deal with uh, not what go into the mouth of the fowls of man first, yeah. and then we'll deal with the other one. So the scripture is Matthew 15. And as y'all see, look, you ain't going to ask a question I can't deal with. I, I, I was sitting at Christian church. So I know what it is that the scripture I'm going to bring up and what y'all going to ask. You always got to understand their point of view, and we understand where we coming from as well. So Matthew 15, 11 is the one they'll go to. Some of them will try to be slick and go to Mark 7, um, but it's the same story. Uh, go ahead, love. Okay, and the reason why I want him to go over this because there are Christians that believe they know who they are mm -hmm. and they believe in the law as well, but they will cut out that dietary part and they'll say, you know, well, I can eat without, I'm not giving up crab, shrimp, bottom feeders, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just want him to bring that out so that you would know that it's in the scripture because some people feel like that's not in the scripture. So I want him to bring, my king to bring it out so he can show you that it is in the Bible. Absolutely. And this ain't personal. So whoever she talking about, is she, ta is she talking about somebody specific or not? I'm willing to talk with you. What's up? Let's wrap. Trust me, I won't run from you. I want I look, trust me, I want it, but I only want to, I want to talk on video. I will not talk to you over the phone. I want to see your face. You get on Zoom and show your face. And I show my face and we talk face to face. I do not want to talk on the phone. Don't phone me. That's video. Video chat. All right. So here we go. 
Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. This is the scripture right here. Not that which goes into the mouth that defileth a man, but that which come out of the mouth. This defileth a man. So this is the verse that they like to use. Now, little do you all know that this was a parable. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. This was not to be taken literal. I'm going to repeat that. This was not to be taken literal. It's not that was going to the mouth of the foul of man, but that was come out of the mouth. This was not literal. This was a parable, a earthly story with a spiritual meaning. Let's get the context, though. Let's go back to verse one, because there was something that was going on dealing with the tradition of men. It was a question that was asked to Yeshua Mashiach of Jesus the Christ. So Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, it says, now remember this, remember it's five questions. This is just a bonus question. Look at this as halftime show. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 15, verse 1, it says, then came to Yeshua, Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were out of Jerusalem, saying, this is the question that they asked them. Why do your disciples, now disciples means students, learners, or followers, okay? Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? So look, they asking him a question about tradition of men. They didn't even ask him about the, uh, the commandments of God. They asking, why are they breaking the traditions of the elders? That's the question that's being asked. Let's see what was the tradition, because it has everything to do with verse 11. It says, for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. What was the tradition? They wash not their hands. It was to wash their hands before they eat the hands. Say it louder. It was to wash their hands before they ate bread. Was this about eating pork? No, it was not. Was this about eating shrimp, catfish, or lobsters, or anything that God say don't eat? No, it was not. It was about what again? Washing their hands before they eat the bread. That's what this is about. Here we go. But he answered, said unto them, why do you, because now they asked a question to him, he asked them a question. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Wow. So they asked about the tradition of the elders being broken. He asked them. Or are these traditions of men that you're talking about, these elders, well, why y'all breaking the commandments of God then? Mm, that's a good question. I thought the commandments of God is done away with, though. Why is he asking them about transgression? Remember we learned earlier, transgressions, remember we learned earlier about the uh, Galatians 3 and 19, the, uh, what purpose did the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. That's breaking the commandment. He asking them, why do you transgress the commandment of God? So why is Christ speaking about God's laws if it was done away with? Why is he asking them, well, why y'all breaking the commandments of God, the law of God? And this is Christ. Oh, that's right. Because he said, think not, I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. So here we go. Continuation. Verse four. For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother. Ain't that the fifth commandment? Yeah. And he that curseth father and mother, let him die the dead. Whoa, wait a minute. Is Christ quoting Moses? Is he quoting what we call the Old Testament? Did Moses say that? Let's see. Maybe we should go to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 9. It says, for everyone that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. That's Leviticus 20 verse 9. Why is he quoting the Old Testament if it's done away with? And I'm using the term Old Testament for the sake of them. Why is he doing that? It says, for everyone that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He have cursed his father and his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Wait a minute. Hmm. 
Matthew 15 again said what in verse 4? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he that curses his father and mother, let him die to death. He just quoted Moses right there. Thought the Old Testament was done away with, though. Sound like a contradiction. What'd you say, love? It is. It is. Verse 5. But you say, whosoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift, but whatsoever you might as be profited by me. So you got the commandment of God, but then you got the elders breaking the law of God. But they got some nerd to come ask why the disciples transgressing the law of the commandment of the elder when you breaking God's law. How dare you come question me about a tradition when y'all in violation of breaking God's commandments? Hmm. Thought the law was done away with though. Hmm. Here we go. This is another thing he said that the traditions of the, I mean, that the elders are saying, because they were breaking the command of God by the tradition. This is what they said. These hypocrites. He says, and honor not his father or his mother. Isn't that breaking the law of God? Yeah. He shall be free. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Why is he saying that if the law of God is in not is in no longer effect anymore if it's voided out why would he say that this sounds like what paul said in romans 3 and 31 look at the last verse right here i'm gonna come right back do we then make void the law through faith in other words do we void out god's law just because we got faith now it says god forbid meaning no yeah we established the law we're gonna bring in the law we're not going to void out God's law just because we got faith now. Just because we justify by faith. We're not going to void out the law. Paul said we're going to establish the law. We're going to bring in this law. Mm. Establish is a big word. Go back to Let's go back to Matthew 15. Here we go. Verse seven, it says, you hypocrites, where did Isaiah, that's what Isaiah's mean, prophesied of you saying, this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is far from me. Wow. So here it is. Christ is quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah. Now, I thought the what we call the Old Testament is done away with. What's your thoughts on that, baby? Um, <clears throat> my thoughts is that it's very contradic contradictory. And um, it just, it, it doesn't make sense. So they will have to clarify, you know. Yeah. Because it's kind of like you backpedaling. Mm -hmm. We love to speak with you. Yeah, I have questions. I love to video chat anybody and speak with you. We can talk about it. Why is he quoting Isaiah? Hmm. He says here, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, meaning for nothing, they do worship me. He called that worthless worship. In vain, they worshiping me. Teaching for doctrines of the teachings, the commandments of men. They're not teaching the commandments of God. They teach the commandments of men. But I thought the commandments of God was done away with. Christ obviously got a problem with that. Now look, where did he get this from? Did Isaiah really say this? Isaiah 29, verse 13, right here. What for the Lord said, this is Isaiah. For as much as these people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me. Right there. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of the doctrine of the commandments of men. Right there. Christ just got done quoting Isaiah. But wait a minute. The Old Testament is done away with according to the church. Not all churches, but the average church. 
Why is he quoting Isaiah? This is dealing with the traditions of man versus the commandments of God, which you all say is done away with. We almost at that verse 11. We at verse 10 now. Oh, we getting there. Remember, verse 2 told us, why do the disciples transgress the tradition of elders for they don't wash their hands when they eat bread? Verse 10. And he called the multitude and said to them, hear and understand. Verse 11. Not that was going to the mouth of the fowl of man, but that was come out of the mouth, this the fowl of man. Now, before we continue, from verses 1 through 11, was there anything about pork? No. Was there anything about a dietary law? No. No. It was simply the question that was asked, why do your followers or students, Christ, why are they breaking the tradition of the elders because they're not washing their hands when they eat bread? Had nothing to do with pork, shrimp, lobsters. Your pastors is lying to you. Has nothing to do with a dietary law. But he's given a parable. He said, hear and understand. Let's continue though. Verse 12. Then came his disciples and said to him, Knowest thou, or do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? They got mad when Christ told them about themselves breaking the commandments of God, telling them when that was going to the mouth of the Father, and they got offended at that. Oh, yeah, sometimes that truth going to offend you. It's like Galatians 4 and 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You will make enemies. This ain't the friend making business. So if you in this walk to make friends, please. You're going to make enemies and they're going to talk about you. They're going to run your name through the mud because you choose to be separate from the world. If you make too many friends, you ain't doing something right. Talk about me. Talk about the man who I was two years ago, three or four and five years ago. Talk about him. Great. So let's continue. But he answered and said, every plant was my heavenly father have not planted shall be rooted up. Letting you know right there, look, if, in other words, if the Lord ain't dealing with you, please, goodbye. You be rooted up out of here. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. Who was the leaders? The Pharisees. And if the blind lead the blind, so if the leaders are leading these people that are following these leaders, both shall fall into a ditch. Both shall fall into a ditch. Next verse. Then answered Peter and said unto him, declare unto us this parable. This was a parable they were speaking about. Tell us what you mean by these things that you're telling us. This earthly story with a spiritual meaning. Mm -mm. Verse 16. And Jesus said, are you yet also without understanding? You also don't know either? Do you? I mean, do not. Ah, tongue twist. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought. That's a question that he's asking there. They understood that this was a parable, that it wasn't literal. Christ is now explaining the parable about not what's going into a mouth of the fowls of man. Because the question was asked, why are they breaking the tradition of the elders? Because they don't wash their hand when they eat bread. Nothing about pork. Verse 18. But those things which proceeded, mean comes out of the mouth, it comes from the heart, which is your mind. Whatever comes out your mouth comes from the heart, comes from your mind. It says, and they defile the man. Uh-oh, now we're going to get some understanding. Has nothing to do with pork. Go ahead. With that scripture that says, and the Christian says, it say this all the time, uh, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Yeah, so that's Luke 6. And let me grab that real quick. Luke 6 and 46. Let's grab that real quick. 45, 46. It says, a good man, I'm starting 43, actually. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, right? Neither do a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. 
For every tree, meaning a person is known by his own fruit. For thorns do not gather figs, nor bramble boys gather their grapes. Verse 45. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, meaning his mind, bring forth that which is good. So that man that's good, he's going to produce things that are good. But an evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bring forth that which is evil. So evil people are going to produce evil fruit. It says, for the abundance of the, a lot, for the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. So yes, absolutely. Now let's go back to Matthew. Look, look, hey, look. Hey, we dealing with this on the fly, baby. We dealing with these questions on the fly. So when we video chat, you better be on your A game. Because I'm going to be ready for these questions. Be on your A game. You, Hey, look, come sharp. Come sharp. I'm going to let you know that. Come sharp. Because this sword going to cut. A sword? Why is he calling the Bible a sworn? Ephesians 6 and 16. <laughs> it says, and above all things, take the shield of faith, wherein you should be able to quench or put out all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That sword, that Bible. Absolutely. That's, he, that's Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. Come with the sword of the spirit. That's the word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12, which says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierced into the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the, of the, of the heart. So that means when you cut them with this sword, ooh we they're going to start revealing their true intentions. They'll start bringing things up. Oh, but see, because I couldn't stand you back what you did back in 1992. I thought this was about the Bible. How are we talking about personal stuff now? It'll reveal their true intents. What this is really about. The problem that they really got with you. You get what I'm saying? You'll start bringing up the Bible. They'll start talking about polygyny. Because we do believe in that. That's another topic. And trust me, I want all the smoke with this topic. I know every scripture you're going to try to bring. 1 Corinthians 7 and 2. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 12. Titus 1 and 6. Going to Genesis 1 flesh. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. Trust me. Trust me. I want to smoke with the topic. Let's go. But I got questions for you. You can ask me questions too. Trust me. Come sharp though. Don't go on Google. If you the type of person got to go on Google, trust me. You don't want to have this conversation. I've seen all the articles. Trust me. You don't want to do this. If you're a Jehovah's Witness and you got the uh, Search the Scriptures book, or you want to go to w, uh, what is it, JW.org, trust me, don't do that. I've seen everything on there. Don't do that. If you're going to need help from somebody, a, a Christian or a pastor, don't come to me by yourself. Come with some help. If you're going to deal with the commentary, Trust me, don't come by yourself. Trust me, you're gonna need some help. All right, but I welcome you can you can know you can double team me. You can bring four or five people with you, and it's just me. All I need is just one reader to read as we're dealing with this. It could be y'all against me. I'm with that, and I won't take it personal. As long as you're respectful, of course. I won't take it personal. But if you come correct, I come correct. If you come humble, I come humble. You raise up, I'm gonna raise up. You know, so I'm gonna meet you where you at. I will, I, I will meet you where you at though. Now, that being said, let's get back to this though. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, and here we go. Verse uh 10 again. It says, and he called the multitude and said, Hear and understand. Verse 11. Now that was going to the mouth of the foul man. Let me let me uh put that boom. Now what's the goal of the mouth of the foul man? Let me highlight that. But that was come out of the mouth. This, that was come out of the mouth. This defile a man. What is he talking about right there? Let me highlight that. All right. Verse 12. Then came his disciples, or students, and learners, and followers, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Verse 13. But he answered, said, Every plant which my heavenly father have not planted shall be rooted up. 
Let them alone. Talking about the Pharisees. They be lying uh, leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. Then Peter said unto him, declare, explain to us this parable. This is what Christ said to Peter. And Jesus uh, and said, and Jesus said, are you yet also without understanding? Do you, I mean, do not yet you understand or do you not understand that whatsoever entered the mouth and goes into the belly and cast out into the drought? But those things which proceeded to come out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. What's the topic about eating pork? No. Now, here we go. Here come your answer. Because remember the question was asked. What was the question? What they asked Christ about the washing hands? Oh, oh they asked Christ, uh, did they wash their hands before they ate the bread? There we go. Yeah. Verse 19 and 20 is your answer to that. Okay. It's the answer to verse 11 dealing with the parable. It's the answer to what defiles us. Here we go. For out of the heart, mean the mind, perceiveth evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemy. Did the same thing about eating pork? No. Shrimp, lobster, and catfish? No. no. So it wasn't really about food. It was about evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemy. These are sins. These are sins. We can't bear false witness against our neighbor. We can't steal. We can't commit adultery. We can't kill, right? That's that's in the law. It says right here, these are the things, not foods. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defile not a man. That's the topic. It was never about pork. So, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy, that's what defiles you. That is what comes out of your mouth. That comes from the heart. That's what defiles you. It had nothing to do with pork. This, this was a parable in verse 11. You read the same story in Mark 7. That's what the topic was about. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because you all will read this verse right here. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Notice that's not even a period right there. Semicolon. It says for the sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So let's go ahead and read this. One, it says every creature of God is good, right? Yeah. Well, the same Paul said this right here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. So Paul said that if you be in Christ, you are a new creature. Can we fillet your back? Are you on the grill? If you in Christ, let me ask you right now, Christians, are you in Christ? Then you are a new creature. You're a creature of God. So can we put you on the grill and fillet your back? Can we eat a baby? Why do some of you Christians feel so bad about, oh, well, don't eat that Chinese food because they might be eating cat. I thought every creature of God is good. All we got to do is pray over it, right? So it don't even matter. My wife over here cracking up. <laughs> she over cracking up. So if, if, if every creature of God is good, then don't get mad about cannibalism. Don't get mad about if somebody want to eat a dead dog or, or a dead animal. Or what? Road a roadkill. Don't get mad at that. Why? Because every creature of God is good. Y'all taking Paul's letters out of context. Trust me, I want to talk about it, though. But let me give you a little snippet of what we're going to talk about if we talk. First Timothy 4, saying that you are a creature of God, right? First Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, Verse one, it says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. And we're seeing that right now. People who have been in the faith are leaving the truth. And they're teaching things they ought not. Then it says, giving heed to seducing spirits. So here it is. These people are not only departing from the faith, but they are being seduced by people with evil spirits, stuff that'll draw you in because it sounds good. 
Sounds like the second Timothy about the itchy ears. But it says in doctrines of devils, meaning liars, deceitful workers, in other words. What else it says in verse two? Speaking lies. That's what they're going to be doing in the latter times. These people who are leaving the faith, who are these people who are giving heed to seducing spirits and teaching um, teachings or messages of devils. They're going to be speaking lies and hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. They are what? Hypocrites. Having their conscience seared with a hot, hot iron. We just had the lesson on this the other day. When these people are speaking lies, these hypocrites, these who are leaving the faith in these last days, when their conscience is sealed with a hot iron, that mean they're not coming off what they believe in. It's if a, like a person gets branded. When a person gets branded in their skin with an iron, it ain't going nowhere. It's there. The Bible said their conscience is going to be just like that. It ain't going, they're going to be unmovable. Can't tell them nothing. That's what these hypocrites is going to be in the last days that are giving heed to seducing spirits and teaching doctrines of devils. They're going to be speaking lies and being hypocrites and they conscious. It's going to be seared with a hot iron. Ain't no coming off it. They're going to be stubborn in this. These hypocrites. What else are they going to be doing in the last days? It says, Forbidding to marry the church today, not all churches, but like the Catholic church with the priests and the nuns, they forbid that they should get married. Not even that people who teach against polygyny too. Oh yeah. You're forbidding people to get married because it's a marriage. And trust me, we can talk about this topic. We can talk about it. And the laws of the land, Romans 13, let's talk about it. I know everything you're going to mention. Let's deal with it. You dealing with a person that's willing to sit with you and talk about, put me in the hot seat. We can talk about it. We can talk about it. It says one flesh, not many. Adam and Eve, not Eve's. Let's talk about it. Because I got some questions. I'm sure you got some for me too. I welcome it. As long as you're respectful though. It says, and commanding to abstain, mean to abstain means to what? To keep away from. For meats. Was God have created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. So you're going to have people that are telling people you can't eat meat. That's a veggie tale doctrine that's going on. The Bible called that the doctrine of devils. Stay away from these devils because that's what it is. Devils, liars, and hypocrites. And you ain't going to be able to come off none of it. Why? Because their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They're going to be forbidding people to get married and telling people you can't eat the meats that God created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. Now ask yourself this. In the Bible, according to the Bible, what are the foods that God created? What are the meats that God created as food? Where can we read where he said these are the foods you can eat and these are the foods you can't eat. That's in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Those are the foods and the meats that God created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe. Because we know everybody ain't going to be fully persuaded. There are going to be people that's going to be like, no, don't eat that meat. That's why I said to them that believe and know the truth. What is the truth concerning our diet? What is the truth that he told us that we can and can't eat according to the Bible? Huh? What can we read this at? That's in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Remember we saw early in John chapter 5, verse 45 through 47, Christ said about Moses, he said, for have you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And if you believe not his writings, how should you believe my words? Moses gave and wrote a dietary law out. He gave us a dietary law. So check it. But you're going to get your hint, though, because look. He says, for every creature of God is good. So either you're going to take that litter and say that you can be uh, on the grill. But it said, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Notice after the word thanksgiving, I ain't talking about the feast, being thankful. <laughs> um, the pagan feast said that. It's a semicolon right there. I mean, there's more to it. 
So the fools that God created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth, those that are fully persuaded, because that's what Romans 14 is about. Fools that uh that you can eat uh one that can believe he can eat all things, and um and one that don't believe he eats herbs, plants, vegetables. So there was one that was fully persuaded and one that wasn't fully persuaded. You know what I'm saying? So in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, you learn about um those that um there was the uh the issue with uh meats being sacrificed to idols or whatnot. So people like to go to Romans 14 and then and they'll and they won't read the whole entire chapter with dealing with the foods. Basically, meat versus veggies. There were some people that said yes, and some people that said no. There were some people that weren't fully persuaded. And that's in Romans 14. That's the topic of Romans 14. But the people they don't really read the whole entire chapter, what it was about. You know what I'm saying? That's why Paul said if, if meat caused my um basically caused people to stumble, I won't eat meat in front of them. Don't let your evil be good spoken of. But anyway. The fools that he created to be received uh, with them are thanksgiving to them to believe and know the truth. The fools that he's talking about, it said it is sanctified. Sanctified means set apart, cleansed, made holy. It is sanctified by the word of God. What we call today the word of God? The Bible. So the fools that he created to be received with thanksgiving the fools of the meats that people are telling people to abstain from were fools that he sanctified by the word of God, the Bible, and prayer. That's what you can pray over. The fool that was sanctified by the word of God. Show me in the Bible was swine was sanctified by the word of God. Hell, he made devil's going to herd a swine that was never swine was never made for food it's a garbage disposal that's the long story short dealing with first timothy 4 that's the food that he created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth he ain't telling you you can go and eat no pork nowhere in the bible he commanded that at all that's the truth concerning the dietary laws. It's sanctified by the word of God. So the pastor got to go into the word of God and show you in the word of God what God said, hey, right here. And you know where they like to go to? Acts 10. Well, right here, um, it says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter told him, not so, Lord, if I've never ate anything common and unclean. And they, they'll read Acts 12, I mean, Acts 10, 12 through 15, but they'll stop there, but they won't read down to verse 28. Verse 28 was the answer to that parable that Peter had. He had a vision three times. And Peter had told him, you know how it was unlawful for a man was as a Jew to keep company or come to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The Christian church think that that vision was about food. No, it was about not calling any man common or unclean. You learn in Acts 10, 28, and you get your confirmation in Acts 11 chapter. But that's another topic. I'll be waiting for you to bring that up and ask me when we talk. We can go into that. Okay, so that deal with that. That's the long story short with that. Let's go to question number four. Half time is over. We back in question four or five. Let's get it. Okay, I got one more. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> another bonus question. Bonus question. This is the last one. All right. <laughs> so... Um, when you talk to people about keeping the Sabbath, mm -hmm. which is Saturday, uh, some call it the Shabbat mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. um, most Christians would say that the Sabbath is Sunday mm -hmm. and not on Saturday. Yeah. So therefore, when they go to church on Sunday, they're, they are keeping the Sabbath. Yeah, so, all right, so now there's so many contradictories in that because in one breath, they'll say they believe in the Ten Commandments. Yes. And the Fourth Commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yes. But then they said, we skip that. So no other gods before me, no graven images. Um, Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We're going to skip over keeping the Sabbath. We're just going to skip that. Yes. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not uh, 
uh, kill. That's not committed adultery. That's not that still don't bear false witness against your neighbor. We're going to skip the fourth one, though. So essentially, it's like, yo, then you only technically believe in nine then. Even when you said where the two commandments, uh, love God with all your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you love God with all your heart and all your soul, that means you're not going to have no other gods before him. You're not going to have no graven images. You're not going to take his name in vain. You're going to remember the Sabbath. You're going to keep and you're going to honor your father and your mother. If you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second greatest commandment, then that means you're not going to kill. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to bear false witness on your neighbor. And you're not going to cover anything that is your neighbor's. So when you keep the two, you're essentially keeping the 10. So that's all. The, that's all. The, so that means they need to take the first greatest commandment is love God with all your heart and all your soul. Right there. The second thing is in what we call the New Testament, long after Paul had died, Acts chapter 17, verse 1, it says, uh, right here, it says, and when they had passed through, um, I mean, for, uh, uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. It says, and Paul, as his manner was, went into them, meaning to the synagogue, the church. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. This is New Testament. Opening and look at this, alleging that Christ must needs have been, have suffered and risen again from the dead, which we believe, and that Yeshua, Jesus, whom I, I mean, whom unto you is Christ, or who's the Messiah. But notice it as his manner was. That means that was his custom, his tradition, to keep service on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke 4 and 16. Talking about Christ. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was Christ's custom. Now, to them to be a follower of Jesus, it means to do what Christ did. Christ kept the Shabbat. He kept the Sabbath day. That was his custom. Right there. It's so much to say on this specific topic. But right there, one, he said he couldn't do it with the law of the prophets. And we see that even Jesus and even the Apostle Paul, whose letters they like to talk, he kept the Sabbath. He kept the Shabbat. Now, one of the things they'll say is, well, right here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 6, this is one they like to use right here. It says, and we sail away from Philippi and abode after the days of unleavened bread, which is Passover, the same feast they don't keep because they keep Easter. But we see right here, long after Christ died, when not died, but went into the heavens, his ascension, that was dealing with the days of unleavened bread. The Passover that you read about in Exodus 12, Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16. Oops. It says, and came to Troas in five days. How many days? Five, five days. Well, we abode seven days. How many days? Seven. It says, here we go, verse seven. And upon the first day of the week, this is what they like to use right here. When, yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> That's where they go to, yeah. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, you see right here, the disciples broke bread the first day of the week. Well, we just seen three chapters before that, that they he, he went into the synagogue on the Shabbat. Just because you break bread on a certain day of the week, don't make that the Sabbath. Paul didn't change the Shabbat. It says Paul preached to them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech unto midnight now wait a minute let me get something straight this changed the sabbath day but if you look in the same chapter right down here in verse 16 it says for paul had determined to sell by ephesus like we get the book of ephesians ephesus because he would not spend the time in asia for he hates it when you hate it that means what you in a hurry for he hates it if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day, the day, not the religion, but the day of Pentecost. Wait a minute. Paul kept Pentecost. That's a holy day that we're commanded to keep. In Leviticus 23, verse 15 through 17, Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks. Shavuot in Hebrew. 
Let's look at that X20 and uh 16 Pentecost right here. Click on that word Pentecost. Let's see what that means. Look at this. Pentecost, a feast of weeks. One of the three great Jewish festivals, even though we know in Leviticus 23, 1 through 6, it never said Jewish festivals. To the feast of the Lord. Leviticus 23, verse 1 through 6, for your confirmation. So-called because it was celebrated on the 50th day, reckoning from the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's what we just read about in verse 6 in this chapter. And the Strong's Concordance says 50th from Passover. Look at this, Pentecost, 50th day. Today it's a religion. It says right here, it says the second of the three, oh yeah, we just read that right here. Here it is, Pentecost is a feast day that they don't even keep. But they follow in Christ though, right? They want to talk about Paul said, well, Paul was in a hurry to keep Pentecost. What about you? He was in a hurry to be at Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. When you ask the average church going, they only know about Acts 2, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues. They'll read Acts 2, verse 1 through 4, but they won't read the context all the way down to 11. I should have been a hundred John Claude Van Damme. It's not tongues. That's another topic. We might can say that for a different video. I should have been a hundred John Claude Van Damme. Tongues comes from the Greek word glossa, which means language. Let me give you just a little snippet. Acts 2 and verse 4, it says, matter of fact, look at 1. Let me uh, take that. It says, my wife was cracking up. <laughs> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the day, not the religion, but the day, it was a day. Tell your pastor to explain what is the day of Pentecost and when was Pentecost disannulled. If he tell you, well, it was disannulled after Jesus died, then why are they keeping it right here? Because right here in Acts 2 and 38, you Christians say this all the time. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission and forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That happened at the day of Pentecost. Oh, but your pastor say you ain't got to keep it no more, though. But right there, why are you quoting Acts 2 and 38 then? Go ahead. Um, sometimes, okay, so when I was in the Christian church under the Pentecostal faith, mm -hmm. Um, Pastor the candy right there. They um had Pentecost. Mm -hmm. They they had it, but it was not a feast. Exactly, it was not a feast. So they would have church mm -hmm. on the Sunday, which is Sunday. Sunday, right? Um, and then they would dress all in white and all of that. So it would be kind of ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Now get this. Did I tell you why it was to be celebrated? Um, the important yeah, love because they they that the Pentecost church is built on Acts 2. And they and they um and that's crazy because and I challenge you all to do your research. Pentecost was to commemorate the Ten Commandments that was given up on Mount Sinai. That's a long story short. Feast of weeks. Wow. Y'all got questions about the feast days? Christians, we can talk about it. We can talk about it. You can ask your questions about it. We can talk about it. So, excuse me, I mean candy. So, then with Acts 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, as it uh, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared clothing tongues, like as a fire, and it set upon each one of them. And you go back to Acts 1, they were already been told that they were going to get this spiritual power from, on the Mount, from, from the Most High. So they knew something was going to happen. Now, you know your history, biblical history, Christ died during the Feast of Passover. And he came back and he was rose for 40 days, according to Acts 1. 40 days. Pentecost is celebrated 50 days after Passover. So this was 10 days after Christ had been gone. 10 days. So look at the word tongue. Remember I told you the word glossal? It comes from the Hebrew word lashon. 
what some people in our community would call Lasha Wan. Let's click on that real quick. Glossa. Glossa. A language. That's what it is. A language. So if you got questions on it in the future, we can do a whole lesson on it. I'll give you a little, a little snippet of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, it says, uh, Crease Arabians, it says, we do hear speak in our tongues or languages, the wonderful works of God. So they knew and understood the tongues that was actually going. They were speaking in the language in which they were born in. Literally. How do we know? Look at verse 8. How we hear every man in our own language wherein we were born. The languages that were born. Was shit about a Honda a language which he was born in? No. Cheeses, cheeses, cheeses. No. Absolutely not. Tongue is a language. Acts 22, verse 1. Men and brother and father, hear you my defense. This is Paul when they were locking him up. He, had, he, he gave his permission to speak when you look at Acts 21, 37 on down, which I make known to you. And how they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue language to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, right there, when he, he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, a language, literally, Ezra, chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, um, is it Ezra 4 and 7? Um, no. Um, what's the scripture I'm thinking of? Um, I just got tongue twisting. Um, Ezra 4. Um, oh, well, I'll come back to it. I got tongue twisting. Um, I'm actually Ezekiel. I'm tripping. It is Ezra. Let me go ahead and wait one second. Here we go. I'm checking you all. What did you say, babe? I said, please do that lesson about the tongue because I can send that to a whole lot of people. Yeah. That tongues is a, um, a big one. Ezra 4 and verse 7, it says, in the days of uh, our Xerxes, if you seen the movie 300, that's who that is, Xerxes. That's the actual name. And in fact, let me click on it and see what it says. Right here. See that? Xerxes. So it says, wrote uh, Bishalom, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companies unto Xerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syriac, Syrian tongue, which is Aramaic, and being interpreted, translated in the Syrian tongue. Some of your Bibles will tell you, now, I want to do this and say this, the King James Bible, let me see. In the beginning of your King James Bible, let me see. Ha, huh? yep, look at this. In your Bible, this is the King James, regular King James Bible. Look at what it says right here, what I'm going to show you. All right, this part right here, right there. Look at what it says. Translated out of the original tongues. Wow. Language. Translated out of the original tongues. Literally. In the most King James Version Bibles. It's a language. Not cheeses, cheeses, shit about a hundred John Claude Van Damme nonsense. Nobody did that. Ain't no angel come down and say, cheeses, cheeses. No. All right. So, that being said, um, wait, do we deal with all the questions, the sidebar questions? You did. Um, it'd be nice if you could do a separate video on the Shabbat or Sabbath, what you yeah. should and should not do, and versus what the Christians have a problem with in keeping the Shabbat. Yeah, I can't wait to do that, and I can't wait to do the one about the women, no, nah, the one about ties, too. Yeah, ties, and because I feel a millionaire. As many times as yeah. <laughs> Trust me when I say your preacher, pastor, if he teaching that you should be paying tithes, he ain't gonna want to talk to me. Mm -mm. He ain't gonna want me ask some questions. I know every scripture you like to use. Malachi three and eight, when a man robbed God, yeah, you have robbed me. But you say we ain't robbing tithes and offerings. But you are cursed with the curse for even this whole nation. 
bring you all the time to the storehouse that I may be meeting in my house and prove me in the house so with, said the Lord of hosts. If there would not be meat, huh, in my house, and prove me now here with, said the Lord of hosts, and I will not meet in my house, and I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that should not be enough to, room enough to receive it. Proverbs 3, about honor the Lord with all your uh, substance and the first fruit of your increase. Well, we're cracking up. 2 Corinthians 9, how the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we've seen them disciples ain't collect no tithes, though, too. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a question. And that 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4, how you took up a collection on the first day of the week. Yeah, we're going to talk. I'm going to have some questions. And trust me when I say that doctrine ain't in the Bible at all. Well, right here in Hebrews 7, Abraham paid tithes. Dealing with Genesis 14. Mm -hmm. But the tater was the spoils of war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to deal with that. Well, Jacob right here in Genesis 28 gave a 10. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk. All right. So what else? Okay. So number four. That's all our bonus question. Mm -hmm. Number four is if you can't keep one law, you can't keep none. All right. So they get that from... um. James 2, say that question one more time. If you can't keep one law, mm -hmm. you can't keep none. All right, so right here, I'm going to start in one, one through eight. It says, um, well, first I'm going to read eight, because I think it's eight, yeah. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, you do well. But if you be a respect of persons, you commit sin, and is convinced as the law is of transgressors. Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offended in one point, he is guilty of all. So let's go ahead and get this. Your hint, if you know how to read, was literally, literally the royal law. Because as I said in the beginning of the video, there's different parts of the law. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Royal law, which is the moral law, dietary law, sacrificial law ceremonial law, judgmental law. Royal law or your moral law is dealing with your morals. How you treat one uh, one of your neighbors and dealing with like 10 commandments, etc. Your dietary laws meets, I mean, um, food, I mean, laws are pertaining to your diet, foods that you can and can't eat. Your ceremonial laws is dealing with your feast days. Like we just read about Pentecost that they don't keep. Your judgmental law was dealing with laws pertaining to judgment. If you broke a law or you transgressed a law, there was something you had to put in place. And you were, of course, killed. That's the judgment that were given to you. Or punishment or crime. Then you have your sacrificial law, laws pertaining to sacrifices. But when you broke a law, so when Paul was saying we're not under the law, but under grace, because we didn't get to touch that. He's dealing with the order of Aaron, a.k.a. The Levitical priesthood, the laws that we're not under anymore, but they don't free you from the commandments of God. And this is one of the things I really want to sit and talk with you Christians about, because there's so many scriptures that even now we even we get a chance to go over. But go ahead, ask that question again. If, Excuse me, I'm eating candy. If you can't keep one law, you can't keep none. Now, one of the questions I usually ask some Christians is, which law can't you get? Well, that lets you know what that person is really about. You can't stop stealing? Can't stop killing? What, you pastors can't stop committing adultery? You don't really want to talk about what that really means according to the Bible. But which law can't you keep? You know how they say, oh, well, you know, they're mixed fabrics. Yeah. You've heard that before? Yeah. We're going to grab that too That's real quick before we... Yeah, so first and foremost, that is a law that you can actually do anyway. But what happens to you, Christians, when you say, I can do all things that Christ that strengthens me? So let me get this straight. <laughs> you can do all things that Christ that strengthens you until when it actually comes to keeping the commandments. That makes sense to you? You can do anything that Christ 
right? Gives you the power to do, but not his commandments, though. I can't do what, what God says. I can do everything else through Christ that strengthens me. So there's a scripture that take out of context, and we come right back to James. Deuteronomy 22 and 11. It says, you shall not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of wool and linen together. That's what I was talking about, the mixed fabrics. Don't sew wool and linen together. Ain't nobody going down the street with that today. Who you see going down the street with wool and linen sewn together? You don't see that at all. So little they know from a scientific aspect, the region that the children of Israel lived in, hot climates, if you would have had wool and linen sewn together in your clothes, it caused a static when you sweat. You'd pass out. That's why he would have said, don't wear that. Leviticus 19, 19. When it says here, it says, you shall keep my statues. It says, you shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. Neither a neither shall a garment mingle a sown of linen and woolen come upon you. Right there. Who's violating that? I've never in my life, even, even before the Bible, I've never had wool and linen together. I've never had that. So when you come up with this nonsense, oh, a mixed fabric, is that 100% cotton? Where you reading that at? Huh? They say that. Yeah, is that 100% cotton? Hush up. So, let's go back to James. We're going to get some understanding. Y'all lucky I ain't putting a lesson together on this stuff. Man, I'll be in trouble. All right, so James chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My brother, have not the faith of Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect to persons. Wait a minute, baby. Is James quoting the Old Testament? Yes. Hold on. Can't be. Let me see something real quick. Leviticus 19 and verse 15. He says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. That's dealing with respect of persons. Wait a minute. Let me um copy and paste this real quick. So you all can see that James chapter 2 is dealing with the law of Moses. Look at that. But the people who can understand the law will understand scriptures and what we call the Old Testament and know what James is talking about. So he says, my brethren, have not the faith of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord with respect of persons didn't he just say right here, you should not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty? That's showing favoritism. Don't treat somebody bad because they're poor and treat the person who, uh, and show honor to the person who was considered to be great, powerful, mighty, well-known. Don't churches do that today? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. They show favoritism in the congregation. Partiality. Hmm. You preachers in violation of that. Oh, this person right here been given, who been sowing seeds into the ministry <laughs> for 20, 30 years versus somebody right here. They only been doing this. Some churches have a $5 line, a $10 line, $20 line, all the way to $1,000 and more. Wow. T.D. Jakes got a section where they can sit. Come on now. We see this in the church. Nobody talks about these things, though. But trust me, I want all the smoke with this topic. Go ahead. It's a church in Houston. When I was calling you, you, well, several churches that I know that where they require your tax return so they can know how much you make. Mm-hmm. I did a lesson on the 501c3 churches. Don't get me started on that. Your church a 501c3 church? I got a video of me talking with a preacher. He said, 
any church pastor that have taken a 501c3 have shook their hands with the devil. That couple of passed them out. You don't want to talk about that topic. Trust me, it might hurt you, it might hurt your little feelings. But hey, this is what it is. Your pastor, no matter how good a person, he's a product and an entity of the state. And there's things he can and can't talk about, and he'll be guilty of treason. Literally. You you members is known as giving units. We, yeah. And he can be liable to pay all that money back or go to jail or be fined. Or the members. Yeah. He can say things that can violate his 501c3. Man. So basically you got a gag order. Mm. Isn't that something? But let's continue. So verse two. For that come, for if that come to your assembly or church, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel. And it also come in a poor man in vile raiment. And you have respect to him that wear the gay clothing. Gay means goodly, wholesome in other words, brilliant, nice looking clothing. And say unto him, sit you here in a good place. And say to the poor, stand you there or sit under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? You'll get some of these people that will tell poor people to leave. Out from in front of their church. I've witnessed it, seen it in St. Louis, Missouri. You have to? Say it, say it. I've seen it in Chicago and Missouri. Yeah. Oh, we. But what about the story of uh, Lazarus, the poor man? In, in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. What if that would have been Lazarus? Christ was poor. Luke chapter 5, 58. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Go ahead. What about the story about the woman that gave the mite? Hmm? The woman that gave the mite? Is that an example? The one that gave the what? The woman that gave the mite, or all she had was a mite, or whatever. Have a mite. Is that the word that he used? Like she didn't have much, but that's what she did. Yeah. Yeah. Did they call it a mic? Mm, no. No. Okay. Yeah. So check it. You see right here a man showing respect to persons. And that's against Leviticus 19.15. James is quoting Moses. Hmm. He's quoting Leviticus 19.15. Let's continue. He says, verse 4, I mean, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brother, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs or inheritors of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him? It even sounds like Matthew 5. The meek is going to inherit the earth, the blesses the poor, right? Uh, Proverbs 19, 17, he that lends to the Lord, right? His, he that lends to the poor, lends to the Lord. So, then it goes on to say, where we are, where we are. Oh, verse six. But you have despised the poor. Now, remember, Leviticus uh, 19, 15 says, you should not respect the person of the poor, showing favoritism. So it says, but you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you were called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbors yourself. You do well. Now, wait a minute. Sounds familiar. Let's go back to Leviticus 19 real quick. So here it is. It says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Here it is. He is quoting what? What we call the Old Testament. What we call, what we call the Old Testament. James chapter 2 again. He's speaking about the royal law, ladies and gentlemen. The royal law. The moral law. Then he says, 
Um, you shall love your neighbors yourself, right? Let's go back. Leviticus 19, when you look at 18, he says right here, you shall not avenge nor bear or carry any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbors yourself. So when he looked, he was quoting verse 15 in Leviticus 19 and verse 18 in Leviticus 19. He's quoting Moses dealing with the royal law. That's what he's dealing with. The royal law. But the church have not been taught about the different aspects of the law. It says, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. Now, remember, sin is what? The transgression of the law. What law they've been breaking? Leviticus 19. So he says you transgress the law. Saying about pork, things like that. This is about the royal law. The whole royal law. He says you commit sin and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. Says for whosoever shall keep the whole law, what law is he talking about? The royal law. And yet offend in one point he's guilty of all. For that he said, look at this, do not commit adultery. This is dealing with the royal law, the Ten Commandments. And so, and also, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you become a transgressor of the law. Why? Because sin is the transgression of the law. Think about something, guys. If we keep in the whole royal law, that's no, um, that's um, honor your father. I mean, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor and don't covet. That's the whole royal law. Dealing with loving your neighbors yourself. That's what James is talking about. But yet, your past is being simple and they understand it. So he says, so speak ye and so do. As they that should be judged by the law of liberty, meaning of freedom. It says, but he shall have judgment without mercy, that he that had no mercy and rejoiceth against judgment. This doesn't go into faith without works, which is, we you know, <clears throat> excuse me, is dead. Absolutely. All right. What's the next one? Um, okay, you answered number three, which was the law was only in the Old Testament, and we don't have to keep it. Mm -hmm. So, um, the last one, number five, is who knows how many laws there are? No one does. So, oh. therefore, how can you keep all of them? All right, so start that over. Who knows how many laws there are or commandments? Because they only pause right there. Hebrews 10, 26 says this right here. For we sin woefully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice of forgiveness for sins. Ask that question again. Who knows how many laws there are? All right, so my comment to that would be, well, brother or sister, what about when you do come into the law, the knowledge of it? What do you do then? Do you not keep it? Or do you keep it? So Acts chapter 17, verse 30 says this. At the times of this ignorance, meaning when you just didn't know, God winked at me and he overlooked it. But now command all men everywhere to repent. You know better and you do better. You know better and you do better. Here's another one. When we talked about the Gentiles. It says... In verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things that are contained in the law, having not the law, law to themselves. So they might say, well, look, I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't, I don't kill. All right. Well, guess what? There you go. You'll be judged by that. You haven't killed. You haven't stole. You haven't did that. Come on, Z. Okay, check this out. First Timothy. Chapter four. And. um. Let's see, uh, ask that question again. Who knows how many laws there are? No one does. So therefore, how can you keep all of them? They do this and it's impossible. All right. But here it is. 
we learn in I how I'll deal with that in a second. So here we go. First Timothy 1 and 8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, those that are keeping the commandment. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, for murderers of mothers, and for manslayers. So here it is. The law is made for those that ain't keeping it. You also have Luke chapter, uh, what's that? Luke 1. Luke 1. And verse 37, it says, for with God, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Right there. So do you got God? Or are you with God? Because if so, without God, there should be nothing be impossible. Ask the question again. You know, the crime of the law is no one does. So therefore, it will be impossible to keep that. Here we go again. So check this out. <laughs> James. Chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give to all men liberally, meaning freely, and abrade if not, and this shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavering or doubt is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. So, brothers and sisters, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. Here's another one. First John 2, verse 27. But the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit, which you have received of him, abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, say all things. All things. Some things. All things. Most things. All things. But as the anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as, just like it has taught you, you shall abide in him. My question is, do you have the anointing, brother? Do you have the anointing, sister? If you have the anointing, is the anointing going to teach you all things like that just said? Or is that a lie? Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit because you know there's no forgiveness in this world, neither in the world to come. That's Matthew 12. So be careful what you say. Is the anointing going to teach us all things? Yay or nay? Because Christ said, let your yea be your yea and your nay be your nay. Anything other that comes from the evil one. John 14, 14, Christ said here, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask Christ, if you ask in the name of Christ, will he do it? Will he tell you what these laws is? Huh? Verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. So the Holy Spirit, if they have that, it'll teach them, right? Okay, cool. You also got Proverbs. Well, y'all so lucky I ain't put together a lesson. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, which says this. Turn you at my reproof, meaning correction. Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. Say, I will pour my spirit out to you. I will pour my spirit out to you. And I will make known my words or reveal my words to you. Right there. Literally. So you either believe that or it's just ink on paper. Turn to his correction and he will pour his spirit out and he will make known his words to you. So if you doing that, turning at his reproof, is he going to pour his spirit out onto you? Is he going to do that? Second uh, Timothy 3.16, it says, for all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, which is what? The teachings. For reproof, when you bring in your evidence. For correction, that's why the Bible is here for to correct you. It's for somebody to be like, hey, yo, look at this scripture right here. Oh, snap, wait. You know what? Hey, it's got me together. For correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, made, uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Didn't Paul say this right here, Romans 7 and 7? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, meaning no. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. Wow. Paul said, I didn't even know what sin was until I knew the law. 
He said, I have not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not cover. That's that Paul teaching against, I mean, teaching the same thing. Well, we don't know what it is. Well, Paul was guilty of that too. But guess what Paul did when he found out though? Repented. What should you be doing? Repenting. If you don't, we don't know, come holler at me. Let's talk. Romans chapter three, verse 20. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, what was the deeds of the law that you had to do before Christ came? Animal sacrifice. That was the works of the law. It says, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But look at this part. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in other words, you don't know what sin is until you know what the law says. Because it said, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So if you say, you asking that question, then you obviously don't know the law. You sitting up under the wrong preacher, the wrong pastor, you're at the wrong church. That's what you're doing. But get this though, that's more. I told you, I can, I can do this all day. First Peter 2 and 2, you might be a babe, right? It says in First Peter 2 and 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. We should be growing. We should be growing. Second Peter 3 and 18, it says, but grow, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through him be glory, both now forever and amen. You're going to be growing in this walk. If you're still stagnant and been in this church 15, 20, 30 years, and you still stag stagnant on the same doctrine, you can't answer simple questions. What have you been doing? Let's say if I'm wrong about everything I've been saying, could you answer my questions if you can't? According to the Bible, you haven't been growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. What you been doing? Nothing. Nothing. And don't confuse my passion for arrogance. I'm passionate about my Lord. I don't play no games when it comes to my father's business, his work. I'm devoted to this Bible. So I take my last breath. And I'm going to earnestly contend for the faith as we read in uh, Jude, verse 3. There's only one chapter. I'm going to earnestly contend for the faith. But if you're a newborn baby, then sit down. Stop trying to teach people. Why are you brothers and sisters starting churches and you can't answer simple questions? Sit your tail down and go learn the Bible first. Learn the basics. You've been in this church and this congregation all these years, and now it's time for you to be a teacher. Yeah, you need somebody to teach you all over again. Why? Because here it is, the word of God has been given unto you, but you dull of hearing. You, you ain't got ears to hear and eyes to see. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and it's hard to be uttered, meaning hard to express or to be said, seeing that you are dull of hearing. For when a time you ought to be teachers, you have, net, you have need that one teach you again. Let's read that again. For when a time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. You have need that one teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. That means you got to go back to the basics. You are still a child in this word. You got to go back to the basics. And it said, and become such as one, as such has need of milk. Who, uh, what human's food is milk? What we call them? Babies. Say it louder. Babies. Babies. You're still a baby in this word. And it said, a not of strong meat. That go one for your meat eaters. <laughs> it says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. For everyone that uses milk is or own milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. But he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them the full of age. That's an adult. Even those who by reason have their senses exercised or trained to discern both good and evil. Good and evil. <laughs> You want some good understanding? Check this out. Ask the question again. Who knows how many laws there are 
No one or commandment. Laws or commandments, there are no one knows. So therefore it will be impossible to keep. Anybody reading the Bible these days? That's a good question. Anybody studying the Bible these days? What are you spending your days doing? Hebrews 11 and 6 say, but it's possible. I mean, so without faith, it is impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder. It's a reward. Reward. He is a reward of them that diligently, diligently, carefully seek him. Are you doing that? Isaiah 34 and 16 say, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Are you doing that? No one of these shall fail and none shall want her mate. The Bible speaks for herself. Are you diligently seeking the Lord? If so, I got questions for you. Surely you have the answers because you diligently seeking the Lord, right? Let's talk. Go ahead, love. Seek ye first the kingdom of righteousness. That's Matthew 6 and uh, 33. Matter of fact, let's get that real quick. Matthew 6. That's a Christian go-to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to go to it. Matthew 6 and 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added on to you. There you go. Seek that. There you go. Right there. Seventh chapter. Just because your preacher's in his church don't mean he getting in. Look at this, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that do the will of my father, which is in heaven, keeping the commandments, Psalm 40 and 8. Another topic. Many were saying to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Uh-oh, there go preachers. And in your name cast out devils? Or oh, there go someone that can do these miracles. And in your name done many wonderful works from charity and things like that, right? Verse 23, and I will profess the sound to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in iniquity. Iniquity, 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 iniquity. What is iniquity? Let's see what the Bible says, what iniquity is. Because whoever he's saying this is, those that do iniquity ain't getting in. What's iniquity? Let's see. First John chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, all unrighteousness is sin. And there's a sin out unto death, right? Look at this. Psalms chapter 5. Look at this. Oh, Lord. Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Psalms chapter 5. What did David say about iniquity? He said, this is when David was praying. He says, the foolishness shall not stand in your sight, for you hate all workers of people of iniquity. I go, you're practicing. God hates those who do iniquity. Jeez. Read the question again. Who knows how many laws or commands is? Right there, hold up. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, it says, a wise man will increase, I'm sorry, a wise man will hear. What does hear mean? Listen, right? A wise man will hear and will increase learning. What that mean? That mean he gonna listen and he gonna learn more. Maybe whoever asked that question to close their mouth and listen. Just shut up and listen, that's all. It says a wise man will hear increased learning and a man of understanding, they're going to attain unto wise counsel. That's the person going to be like, that's it right there. That's the truth. That's the truth right there. That's wise counsel right there. That's wise thoughts. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to wise counsel. What about Proverbs 3 and 6, which says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Right there. So if he's going to direct your path, is he going to direct your path to a, a, a place of darkness to where you're not going to know? Make that make sense to me. What about Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. What about Proverbs 4 and 7? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all your getting. Get understanding. How do you get good understanding, y'all? Let's go to Psalms chapter 111. Yeah, I told you, my sword is sharp. Psalm chapter 111 and verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding 
have all they or all those that do his commandments. That's why you don't have a good understanding because it don't keep the commandments. It's praise and do it forever. Hmm. Isn't that something? Let's go to Sirach or Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse uh, 11. Be swift to hear and let your life be sincere and with patience, give answer. If you have understanding, answer your neighbor. If not, lay your hand up on your mouth. That means be quiet. Go ahead. Can you explain to them about that? About the apocrypha, well, I, I do got a video on YouTube. It's called a pop. That'll go into a whole nother lesson within itself. Uh, but I did do a lesson on YouTube um, real quick. It's on my old YouTube channel. Let me pull it up real quick. This is my old YouTube channel. I did an old lesson on this old channel, and it's called Apocrypha on Trial. And that is, you see right there is an eight hour lesson, basically dealing with the Apocrypha, literally. So if you, if you want to know about that, I did one. And also, uh, I talked a little bit about it, um, here, hold on, on my new channel. I talked a little bit about it. I think I did. Let me see. Yeah. Is the Apocrypha missing books on trial still? So I talked a little bit about that one. That's a 21 minute video uh, as well. Um, so if you all want to know about the Apocrypha, um, you can uh, definitely watch that. Also, uh, you have what's known as the Septuagint. I'm sure your preachers know about that. The Septuagint is the first time the Apocrypha was mentioned. Apocrypha is a title, means hidden a secret. I also got the Geneva Bible, which is predates the King James Version Bible, authorized to be translated in year 1560 uh, versus the King James Bible of 1611. It has the Apocrypha in it as well. You know what I'm saying? But that's another topic. As you see, I got lessons on it as well. Um, but we could talk about it, preacher. We could talk about it. I'm with that. You know what I'm saying? So ask that question again. The last question again. Who knows how many laws or commandments there are no one does, so it would be impossible to keep. So it would be impossible to keep, right? It would be impossible to keep. Let me share my screen again. It will be impossible to keep. Well, seeing that the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Meaning it's not a burden on you. You can do it. 2 John chapter 1 verse 6, which reads, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you heard from the beginning, oh, it's Old Testament. You should walk in it. You should walk in it. First John chapter two and verse three, it says, and hereby we do know that we know him. Like this is how we know if we know God. If we keep his commandments, he that saith I know him, I know God. I got a relationship with God. I pray to God. Okay, to know him is to have a relationship with him. You can't have a, you can't have a relationship with somebody that you don't know. He that says, I know him and keep him not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily or truly is the love of God perfected. Why is that? Because we just read that the love of God is to keep the commandments. And hereby we know that we are in him. It says, and he that saith he abideth in him or live in him ought himself to walk, to walk even as he's walked. How has he walked? Leviticus 26 and 3, if you walk in my statues and keep my commandments and do them. Why is it that God told us to keep something that we can't keep? Yes, of course, we fall short. And yes, we need Christ. Look at the last verse, I mean, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 22 and verse, no, is it Revelation 22? Uh, Revelation 22 and, um, no, wait, wait. I'm tripping. Revelation 14 and 12. It says, here is the patient of the saints, mean the holy ones. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's the last book of the Bible right there. Revelation 22 and 14. Blessed. You want a blessing? Blessed are they that do his commandment. That's what it says right there, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through Enter in through the gates into the city. What city? New Jerusalem. 
the same city with 12 gates. It says, look at this. And it had a wall great and high. It had 12 gates. And at the gate, 12 angels and names written on, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. That's the new Jerusalem. That's the new Jerusalem. Now, I believe we're going to cut it here, unless you want to end it with this some. Okay. Now, um, what what would you like the Christians to know in this video? Anything we can end with that, I guess. Anything you would want them to know? Um, I would just um, I would just I just want you to know that um, we my my king he teaches the whole entire Bible, and we believe the whole entire Bible. Oh, pause real quick. Okay. I'm sorry. He believed in the whole entire Bible. Check this out. First John chapter 5, verse 10. It says, He that believeth in the Son of God have the witness in himself. He that believeth not God have made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his son. What's the record that God gave of his son? The Bible. I believe in the record that God gave of his son. John chapter 7, verse 38. Look at what Jesus said. He that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, not how your pastor talk. I believe on Christ as the scripture have said. But it said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. So, go ahead, love. So, yeah, I just want you to understand that, uh, like I said, my husband, he teaches from the whole entire Bible, uh, from cover to cover, mm -hmm. you know, all 66 books. So just understand that um, he's not coming from a inspirational, uh, well, I'm not going to say inspirational, but he's not coming like a motivational speech, mm -hmm. like what you get in the Christian church. Right. And so he comes with the actual scriptures so that you can understand how this walk is supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that will help you come into the truth. Uh, yes, it takes some time for you to get understanding, but the more you understand, the more uh, that mindset of Christianity will be broken down and you will be able to receive more of the truth. Absolutely. And I pray at the most high. Well, I first want to say I'm very passionate, so don't mistake my passion for aggression and all of that. I'm very passionate about the word of God, and I don't play around when it comes to this Bible. This is my life. I've been doing this over 10 years, you know what I'm saying? So I've dedicated my life to, to defending the Bible and the gospel. Um, it's one of my favorite topics. I once sat in that Christian church, and I'm still a Christian, meaning I still follow Christ. As well, you know what I'm saying? So I pray that the most high soften you all's heart. And I pray that the most high will continue to increase you all and understand. As a matter of fact, let me say something real quick. Somebody be like, he keeps saying the most high. Let me say that real because that bothers Christians too. Deuteronomy 32, I'll give an example. Verse 8. It says, when the most high, look at that. When the most high divides of the nations, their inheritance. When he separates the sons of Adam, what does that mean? When he separates the sons of Adam, that means mankind, right? How did he do it? He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, right? Now, one may say, well, you know, I get that. That's Old Testament. Ain't no most high, no New Testament. Mark chapter five, verse seven. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Look at that. Luke 8, 28. Is it 28? I think I might be wrong. No, it is. It is it. Same story right here. He was called Jesus, son of the most high God. Same thing right there. Same thing. Same thing. Um, Hebrews 7, 
and one. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Salem, priest of the Most High God. Right there. Acts 16, verse 17. It says, right here, it says, the same follow Paul and us and Christ, saying, this, uh, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. So right there, the most the word most high is in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. Don't get discouraged because you hear that. All right. I know some of you Christians love Samuel, right? Second Samuel 22, verse 14. Look at this. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the most high uttered, uttered his voice. I know some of y'all love Psalms, right? Don't they love Psalms? Yes, they, do. they love them some Psalms, right? Let's get Psalms 9 and 2. I will be glad and rejoice in thee, and I will sing praise to thy name, O Most High. O thou Most High. Look at that. O thou Most High. That's a song. Huh? That's a song. Yeah, so look at that. They say Most High right there, you know, in the song. Look, see, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. Psalms 46 and is it 4. It says, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Chapter 40, Psalms 46, in, I mean, Psalms 47 uh, and 2. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is great. I mean, he's a great king over all the earth, over all the earth. I'll give you one more. Psalm 73. Is it 11? Yeah, it says, and they say, how do God know? Question. And is there knowledge in the most high? So when you hear me say the most high, now you get it. It comes from Hebrew Elyon, which is supreme. All right. So I pray that the most high give you all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I pray that the most high soften you all's heart so that you, you're able to receive what you learn. This is not even scratching the surface. There's so many scriptures that we did not get a chance to go over that I would love to go over um, because there's so many scriptures in what we know as Paul's letters. We didn't get it. We didn't get a chance to go over uh, Romans 10 and 4. Christ is the end of the law. We didn't get a chance to go over that. We didn't get a chance to go over Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 16 on down to 21. We didn't get a chance to deal with Romans 3. Um, um, we didn't get a chance to deal with 2 Corinthians uh, 3. Uh, dealing with the letter of the law is so many things that we didn't get a chance to go over. But I pray that the Most High softens you all heart so that you can understand that your Christian church has been wrong. Your pastor has lied to you. He's gone to school, got all these degrees to teach you a lie. That's what has been going on. You know what I'm saying? So if you pastors that are upcoming pastors, if you pastors that are all preachers, look, I welcome you all. Let's sit and talk about it. Let's dialogue. We can talk about it. Have an open mind, though. You know, oh, you should send this video even to your brother as well. Yeah, send it to him, too. Brother, I hope you watch this video. You know, hey, I'm ready. We can talk again. I'm ready. You know I'm ready, so let's go. We can talk. I welcome you, anybody in the family, anybody in my family, whoever. Whoever wanted, we can have a dialogue. We can have a discussion. Or I can bring the smoke. Whichever one. We can debate whatever you want to do. I'm with that. I don't care if it's four in the morning. Let's get up. Let's talk about it. Oh, I'm tired. Get up. Let's talk. But I won't do it over the phone, though. I want to do it over video. I want to see your face. I want you to look me in my eye, and we're going to talk. This is it. This is me giving it, uh, the invitation to the Christian church. You know what I'm saying? So the Christian church, and I would rather do it privately. The reason why is because when you do it public, everybody too busy Worried about winning the argument versus what the what is actually saying. You get what I'm saying? So I would rather talk with you one on one. If if you want to do four on one, that's cool with me too. Just let me have a reader, and yeah, we we gonna well I'm gonna ask some questions, you know, and yeah, we 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 can definitely do that though. You know, I welcome you all. Um, so once again, if you ain't seen this whole video, don't 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 even try to ask to talk. At least see the whole video. You can ask questions. You can critique it. Let's talk about it. You know what I'm saying? So all praise to the most high and the name of his only begotten beloved son, whom the Christians know as Jesus the Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach. I do believe in the father. 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I do believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection. I believe in the whole Bible from cover to cover. I'm not atheist. I believe in Christ, but I believe on Christ as the scripture have said. I do believe it that the Bible is the record that God gave his son. And if it's in the Bible, I believe it. I'm going to say that again. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. I believe it. I believe all of it, the way that it was written and the way that it was interpreted as well. You know what I'm saying? So if there's a preacher out there, if you want to talk, we can definitely talk. If you want to go into um, the Hebrew language, we can definitely do that as well. I do read the Hebrew language as well. As we see, verse 2, Coming on down to verse 4. All right, so I definitely deal with that. Verse 8, Verse 9, I'm would you read the whole Ten Commandments now? Kisha she yamin ase yahowa et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz et hayom ve'et ka asher bam vayanach bayom hasvi'i kin or kain berach yahowa et yom hashabat v'chashehu. All right, so yeah, y'all get the point. So we can deal with the Hebrew language um, as well if you like. I'm with that. You know what I'm saying? So, um, hey. You want to debate, come with your A game. I'm just going to say that. You know what I'm saying? Because, hey, you won't find out Judah the shooter because I will shoot them scriptures. Bye. I want my seven children, and I should be back on time. Thank you, Art, and thank you, Pastor Cisneros. And this is a little thing I've always done, and I always enjoy talking to intelligent audiences, and these precious little children are going to help me. Now, I'm going to name these children, and I want you to learn their names. I want to see if you can do what other audiences have done. The first one we're going to name, let's not name them. Let's just say when I point to this one, sin. What is it? Sin. Come on, everybody. What is it? Sin. Once more, sin. this one is law. Who is this? Law. Who is it? Law. This is grace. Who is this? Grace. Once more, grace. let's go backward. Grace. Law. Sin. That's very good. Let's go again. Savior. Who is this? Savior. Savior. Come on. Savior. Now, this one is gospel. What is it? Gospel. Let's see if we can go now. Sin, law, grace, Savior, gospel. Pastor Ortiz, we got another good audience. Now let's do it all the way to the end. This is? Sin, law, grace, Savior, gospel. This is preacher. Who is this? Preacher. And this one is church. What's his name? Church. church. Now, let's go and let's quote the Bible. The Bible says, who says? Bible. The Bible says that Sin. is the transgression of God's law. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's do it one more time. The Bible says that Sin. is the transgression of law. Whoever hates Sin. must uphold the law. Whoever fights the law is upholding Sin. whether he likes it or not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Come on, ladies and gentlemen, Grace. is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. Very good. Let's do that one more time. Grace. Is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And the Sin. die that we might have Grace. which is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And Sin. gave us the law. which is the good news about the now the preaches the in his church. 
Now today, you've got men fighting God's law in church. And they say that the law is done away with. You may go, darling. Now, if you do away with the law, the Bible says where there is no law, there is no sin. So you may go, darling. And if you do away with sin, you don't need sin, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And if you don't need grace, you certainly don't need a sin who died that we might have grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And in that case, you don't need a... Because it's the story of a Savior who died that we might have grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And if that be true, what in the world do you need a... And if you don't need him, he might as well throw away the... 